Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's 5.30. We'll make a start. Welcome to the City of York Council Health and Adult Social Care Policy and Scrutiny Committee um, for the special meeting this evening. Um, we do we are joined by the chair of the Children and Education Committee as well uh, this evening, um, just in case there's any um, overlap uh, with any of the content that I might want to, to discuss with, with members of his committee. I'd like to uh, welcome a number of guests um, both in the room and uh, online remotely with us this evening. So uh, welcome to Stephanie Porter uh, from the NHS uh, Humber and North Yorkshire Integrated Care Board and uh, Prof Professor uh, Mike Holmes uh, from the Haxby Group and uh, also represents Nimbus Care, um, a collection of GP uh, practices across the city. And we also have Simon Bell uh, remotely um, Simon Bell is the Interim Place Director for the York Health and Care Partnership. Um, we do have apologies from uh, Stephen Eames, who's the Chief Executive of Humber and North Yorkshire a Health and Care Partnership. Uh, Councillor Cullock and Councillor Wardby's uh, substituting, and also from uh, apologies from Councillor Barnes. Uh, we do have some um, colleagues um, on the line from both uh, City York Council and also from um, other authorities. So I'd uh, like to um, give a, a wel warm welcome uh, remotely um, to Councillor Linda Bayram, who's the Vice Chair of Healthcare and Wellbeing and Scrutiny at um, the East Riding of Yorkshire Council. Uh, Christine Philipson, who, and, um, who's the Principal Democratic Services and Scrutiny Officer with North Yorkshire County Council. And um, we have... Um, I think that's it from the other councils. And we also have Jamaila Hussein, uh, who's the Corporate Director of Adult Services Integration. She's uh, remotely online. And Sharon Stoltz, uh, who's the Director of Public Health. She's also attending remotely. Sadly, she has uh, she has COVID, but she is she's well enough, I understand, to, to join us online. Um, so I hope you um, have a speedy recover, Sharon, if you're, if you're listening currently. Um, we did have... Um, indication from one or two of the other councils within our uh, partnership area that uh, they're, they're not attending because they'll be actually having um, colleagues from the from the uh, ICB uh, directly to their scrutiny committees. Um, but welcome everyone online. Um, does that, do any members here have any declarations of interest um, other than um, other than uh, registered already? No. <laughs> Um, for members of the Health Scrutiny Committee in York, um, are you happy with the minutes from the meeting of the 22nd of November? It's pages one to eight. Anything that anyone wants to raise from there now? That's, that's fine. We don't have anyone registered to speak in public participation this evening, um, so we can go straight to the, um, the main item, um, which is... Uh, the NHS Humber and North Yorkshire Integrated Care Board upgrade, uh, update, and um, I think Stephanie and Mike here will probably present. Um, I'll give a quick uh, run through of the uh, the slides and the presentation that we've received already. Um, good evening to you both, and thank you for, for joining us. Um, I will quickly say to the colleagues that are, are, are online, um, I will, obviously I can't see when you're indicated to speak, so now and again I'll just um, ask if anyone has anything they want to raise, and we'll try and bring you in that way. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening everyone, I'm Steph Porter. Um, I'm going to focus on York. But for colleagues from other authorities, if I can't answer any specific questions, I'll happily go uh, away and um, pick up any queries. Obviously, one of the things that we wanted to talk about really was, was how the uh, integrated care board, integrated care system would continue to interact and respond to uh, local scrutiny groups. Um, and our colleagues, uh, Stephen Eames and uh, Amanda Bloor, apologise for not being able to, to attend. Um, but we, you do have Simon Bell, who's the interim place director. And um, by way of, of uh, the slides that came through previously, um, we've highlighted there where 
we will um, be focusing on on the place. So the place director um, and uh, the ICB has now identified six places of which York are one. And we've been operating as a as an integrated care system, an integrated care board for formally since the 1st of July, but, but about a year or so. I'm hoping that some of these arrangements um, don't feel too alien to you. And um, if you've been interacting in the health system for, for, for anything more than five years, this, this might be your, your multiple interaction of, of, a, of a new NHS organisation, but 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 we're still key players. I've been in the NHS in North Yorkshire and York for, for 32 years. So I'll just pause there. So I work exclusively for, for York, but I have a, a specialist function of estates and capital. So I interact uh, with other places uh, around that specialist function, but I work with other heads of, of primary care. So um, 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 and Mike's joined, joined me. Thank you. Uh, Mike, and I'll just let him introduce before I go on with the ICB. Thanks, Steph. Um, so thank you for inviting us here. My, my name is Mike Holmes. I'm a, a GP with Haxby Group, one of the practices in the city of York, but also has uh, practices in Scarborough and in Hull. I'm a partner there and I've been for over 20 years. Um, and I'm the chairman of Nimbus Care, as Councillor Doughty pointed out. So Nimbus Care is a as an organization formed by all 11 practices in the city of York Place. Um, and um, I also have a national role as the chair of the trustee board at the Royal College of GPs. So have a national perspective as well. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the pressures that we're facing uh, from a general practice perspective in the city. I sit on the place board um, um, on behalf of all the practices in the city in my role as the Nimbus Care Chair. Thank you. So unless people have lots of questions about uh, the statutory arrangements, um, which are obviously I'll, I, I will answer, I'll, I won't focus too much on the structural in, um, uh, arrangements of the integrated care system. Um, but what I will do, I think, is just highlight that we're very keen to just continue to reinforce that um, place remains the driver of, of, of change. So um, we'll be focusing and interacting uh, around York place issues. And, and as, as Mike's indicated, we have a York Health and, and Care Partnership Board that's chaired by Ian Floyd and uh, all partner organisations are, in, are in, that, in that space. Um, uh, very kindly, uh, one of my direct colleagues from the ICB has is, is, is just indicated the, the whole system operating model. Um, and for people on, on the phone, that, that just sort of indicates the, um, the, the six places and how that, that works beneath it. Um, and again, just highlighting really how we, how we will uh, interact and engage. Um, I'm on the Health and Wellbeing Place Board, the the uh, York Place Director will also have a, have a have a key role on the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, councillors may be aware of, of the, the York Collaborative. Um, so we, we have quite a, a, a strong and uh, long-standing um, set of arrangements of, of working with partners in help. Now, you, you asked us to um, come along and talk about uh, both the integrated care system, integrated care board, um, but also perhaps to focus on some of the, the pressures that we're experiencing at the moment. Um, couldn't have chosen a more appropriate week um, to, to have that conversation uh, with you. Um, and I did invite my acute uh, colleagues from York and Scarborough Trust to 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 join me to to um, to to um, meet with you, but there are so many operational pressures at the moment that they that they haven't been able to come along uh, this evening. So again, I thank Mike for being able to uh, come and give a uh, an operational perspective. Um, that that's um, will will 
bring some of our examples to light for you. So York have provided their activity data um, uh, for us to, to, to talk about and, and have a look at. Um, today, we have 584 uh, uh, residents, patients who are waiting over 78 weeks um, and we've got a total waiting list um, for our acute provider of over 50,000 patients. Um, this is referral to treatment activity up to August um, but, but, the, but the figures that haven't materially changed uh, we're, we're, we're at October data now. Um, and um, I've just moved on to some of some of the the commentary, and and you 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 have this in in your pack. Um, but one of the things that's changed since since we sent through the 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 um, presentation pack last week was that uh, York Foundation Trust are now in Tier One elective recovery, which means that they are receiving national support to improve that electric uh, elective recovery position. Um, and that's predominantly because York are, are still forecasting that they will not eradicate all patients waiting 78 weeks by the end of March. And that's a key matrix for us. Particular pressures are in MaxVax, which um, relate to dental extractions. Um, I imagine all at scrutiny are familiar with the pressures on dental services in, in York, that, that's a recurrent theme, one which we haven't managed to crack. They've also got particular pressures in ET, ENT and also routine care. Um, now, that's not that we're standing still. We, we, we've work, we're working well as um, an, a, a collaborative of acute providers across the ICS. So they're working with other hospitals on, on mutual aid. So that's around consolidating lists for particular specialties and, and doing them in, in, in one centre. Um, we continue to work with the independent sector where they have capacity. Um, and also York have brought in additional theatre teams to operate over the weekends. Um, so that's often um, referred to as, as sweating the physical asset, so making our theatres work. Um, but they can't run 24-7. There's downtime for cleaning. There's downtime for routine maintenance. Um, and the limiting factor is, 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 is always staff, staff availability, staff wellness. Um, and... We know that there is a particular risk as we talk about winter pressures um, for patients who need a bed overnight. Um, one of the themes that we'll will that, that we'll pick up on is um, same day demand influencing everything that you might be able to plan for. The more same day urgent care activity you have, the more it nibbles and encroaches into your planned, uh, your planned and your routine activity. And with the best will in the world, no one is sat around with empty beds. Nobody's sat around with uh, wards if they, can, if they can staff it. So we've got this resource and, and we are flexing it as, as as best we are able to. I'm going to invite uh, Mike to just talk about some of those things around um, what we do to support patients who are waiting, because um, we, we do know that it's an anxious time, they can feel unsupported, that unsupport sometimes often manifests itself in ringing GP practices just to say where am I on the list or I have I have deteriorated so we have put some additional support in um, for for York residents to support our acute colleagues. Yeah thanks Steph I think the key part about this is that it's general practice and the acute trust working together to solve a particular problem or well, not actually solve it but to manage the problem given the waiting times are so long and you've seen that on the slides, you know, um, some of the routine waiting times can be getting on for two years. You know, it's, it's, it's really quite difficult. Um, and actually what, what meet, what that, what, how that materializes is that if patients are on a, a waiting list and they are um, having issues with their health or deteriorating, it's quite difficult for them to, to contact the acute trust and get an opinion. So what we've done is worked with them to putting a, put in a proactive support system so we're contacting people checking that they're okay 
inviting them to, to to let us know if they're not and then trying to work out what the best solution for them is um and we think that's that's better than um you know leaving them on the waiting list allowing them to deteriorate and then presenting when things are in extremis we're trying to be get upstream of that it's quite difficult for us to jump cues you know i think we get patients coming to say um i'm getting worse and um can you bring my appointment forward can you write to the hospital well it's quite difficult because we have to try and be equitable with all of that. And often what we find is, um, and, and I think this is a documented phenomenon that those who shout loudest often get what they want. And, and you know, sadly or, or not sadly, that is inequitable. And we have to we have to be really mindful of that. So this is about ensuring we respond to need. Um, and, and we've also got this system um, around advice and guidance, which you can see in the bottom bullet point on the slide, where where we can actually write into a hospital specialist and get an opinion. So if we're not certain about um, a patient's current condition and we think it might warrant a more urgent intervention, we can use the advice and guidance platform to get a fairly quick um, opinion from a consultant. Bear in mind, you know, they are pretty busy at the same time. So it's 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 quite difficult to do. But this seems to be working. And I think what it shows is that level of collaboration and um, solidarity actually across the health and social care system, which feels like a really healthy, um, healthy position in, in what is quite a, a difficult situation. Christian, did you have a quick question you want to ask? I just got a quick well, question, a, yes. yes, if I may, if I can just. Hmm. Um, and I'm going to refer to myself not because I'm more important than anyone else, but because it's a personal experience. Hmm. Um, one of the things I've found difficult, hmm. and I know others have found difficult as well, is when you're waiting to see a consultant to actually get a diagnosis of what it is you have. And that period of worry on wanting to know, is it this, is it that? Um, and I personally, I mean, I've experienced waiting over a year for that. And I know a lot of people are doing that. So I'm just keen to get a sense from you both as to what's being done to manage that. You have referred to two-way conversations between GPs and consultants. So I was just wondering if you could expand a little on it. Well, um, the reality is in, in many cases, we can make diagnoses from from clinical assessment, clinical history and, and assessment, but in some cases it requires di diagnostic um, tests or um, you know biopsies, you know interventional diagnostics, and of course we can't really do that um, without access to hospital. Yeah. Um, so it, it is difficult, and I totally empathise with you. We're in this very unprecedented situation where you know the, the capacity for doing that sort of thing, even you know things that we perhaps take for granted these days like MRI scans the waiting time is significant now yeah. really significant months and months and months so it's it's challenging it's challenging for patients it's challenging for healthcare professionals um for families for everybody and and all I can do is empathize with that there simply isn't enough capacity in the system to make that much more responsive and what we have to do is prioritize need so you know we have various mechanisms in the system that enable us to say well someone is at for example, a high risk of having a cancer diagnosis, and therefore there's a process, a two-week wait process that enables them to get their, their, their tests and their diagnoses quicker. So we're constantly um, uh, assessing uh, need and priority and urgency and making decisions as we go along. And, and, you know, whilst I totally accept that's not the ideal scenario that any of us would wish to be, and it's, it's, the, it's the reality of the, of the current situation. Thank you. Sorry, do you want to continue? Um, is it is something specifically on this? Because, yeah, I don't want to continually interrupt while we're, we've got the presentation. That's it. But if it's specifically, yes, yeah, specific while we're there, that, we're... it's um, point three, actually, um, where it's talking about the single text message. Is that the only um, means of contacting people? Because it's good that they are contacting people, obviously, but I'm um, um, just thinking of. Yeah, people in my own family who, if you sent them a text, you're never getting any sort of response. Sure. No, I think wherever possible, we try and have multiple, right. multiple ways of accessing exactly. patients. I mean, I think the reason we're trying to embrace technology as much as possible, and that not only is text messages, but e-consultation access systems, is because those people who do do that, 
create space in the system for those people who can't. So in reality, everyone benefits from that. Yeah, great, yeah, thanks. I am <clears throat> gonna focus on primary care. Um, is the pace okay for everybody? Do you want me to speed up? Seems fine to me, I think. Okay. So 80% of the activity in the health system happens in general practice. Um, we use the global term primary care to mean most things that happen out of a hospital. But on the whole, we're talking about what happens in general practice. So um, I've, I occasionally just like to remind myself of our individual practices, and particularly now that I'm focusing on York, not the Vale of York. Um, so we have around about 250,000 registered patients in our 11 practices, and they operate out of five PCNs. So our, our East colleagues in East York, um, they've got registered patients who are citizens, uh, residents of, of, e of the East Riding. Um, and our Vale colleagues, and we still interact with them. And, and when we've been talking about um, elective weights for the hospital trust, I'm referencing York and Scarborough Hospital Trust, but they uh, relate to, to, our, <clears throat> to our practices. And boy, are they working hard. I sent through uh, the OPAL status report and I had to remind myself what OPAL stood for. I've been using it so long that it, it was worthwhile just going back. But it's it's the operational pressures escalation level. And it, it really goes from zero. Anybody who doesn't report, we assume that they are on level one. Level three, and it, it it's starting to feel very, very uncomfortable. Level four. We last year we didn't see it at all. Um, so just to put that into context, um, we are now having practices report Opal 4 um, and we work to support them, but it's basically a, a combination of demand grossly outstripping supply. Um, and I say grossly because our practices manage uh, demand and supply. That's part of what they do every day. Um, uh, you know, it's part of what leads to, to, to the national press saying, why can't you do more open 24 hours? Um, because it's a, it's, it's it, to some extent, it's an, it's an non-visible activity. General practices soak this stuff up like sponges, um, but no more. Um, our practices are, 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 are really, really feeling the strain. Um, one of the new slides that I put in was was the Opal reporting from from the twenty eighth of twenty eighth of, of of November, and I just wanted to talk about what's happening today because we've got four practices on Opal four, um, and um, we've we've got we've got ten on Opal three, and that's a combination of demand. Um, and uh, one of the slides I talk about the demand due to. Um, uh, strep A uh, and and uh, the number of calls that we're getting. But if I talk about Pocklington today, on an average uh, Wednesday, um, they have seen uh, 116 more calls, 116 more calls from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. Uh, that's a, you know, um, that means that these are people who are ringing and they they mostly need urgent on day. A lot of children, a lot of parents worried about, uh, about rashes. And what that means is that that practice has to pretty much respond to that same day activity. And if it's happening day in, day out, the only way to manage that capacity is that it impacts on routine appointments and routine wakes. Um, now, I wouldn't wouldn't be so bold as to to, to reference um, uh, Sharon on, on on the call, but um, I think we've lost a sense of what COVID wave we are in, and the exposure of our health professionals to flu, COVID, even when fully vaccinated, we are we are seeing 
um, continued unsustained staff absence due to ill health. Now, it's not the same practice every day. It's not the same practice every week, but it but it is sustained across across the piece. And I, I'd also make the point that we often focus on our clinical staff, but we cannot work without our support services, without our admin staff. Now, I know because I, I had cause to ask this of the Haxby group only, only yesterday, that of, of a, a staffing complement of 18.5 reception staff, they are currently at 10. Now, they've been out constantly recruiting um, and they've recruited two, which we think is successful. But in, in the period that they'll onboard those two, another member of staff will retire. So we're constantly at a steady state or, or below a steady state. Um, yeah. And Steph mentioned the level of sickness. Now, the level of sickness is um, acute infections. Obviously, we're not human beings. We're not immune to these things. And of course, you're in contact with, by definition, a um, a population who probably does have a higher prevalence of these infections or an incidence of these infections. But I'd like to draw your attention, if you can see my practice at Haxby Group Practice, about halfway down, and you can see that on the 5th of December, it was purple. We reported Opal 4 on the 5th of December. That was a week past Monday, I think I'm right. That was the that was when the Group A strep surge hit. We saw a 20% increase in demand on that day, and it was accompanied by five GPs being off sick. So you get this, these kind of perfect storms um, form. So we had no choice but to call Opal 4. And just to come back to Steph's point about Pocklington today, and, and I, it's the first time I'd heard that figure today, because obviously I, I wouldn't necessarily hear that. But if I put that into context, so 116 calls. Now, each GP surgery, so that was in a morning, each GP surgery would have around 15 or 16 appointments. So that equates to eight additional GPs that morning. So just to give you a context around how long it takes to deal with, because you might think, oh, it's a quick phone call. Well, it's not really. You've got to take a proper history. You've got to listen to the patient. You've got to make an assessment. You've got to come with a shared management plan. You've got to safety net that in case the advice you give, um, you know, that, that what you predict happens doesn't happen and then and advise them how to get back in touch. So these are not quick interactions. You know, they are 10, 15 minute consultations. So, um, just to give you a context of what that feels like on the ground. Thanks, Steph. So just a bit of context, because we do we do talk about the care delayed by by COVID, but but in any sort of quarter, it, it, it could be any of the things that we're talking about. So the focus is is currently on group strep A and um we we peak around blue, of course, occasionally. Um, so as I as I referenced, um, same day demand then will impact on routine care, and it's the same for all of our services. I, I talked about um, about elective about elective care. Um, now I think uh, last summer, I, I would say last summer was just hideous with the negative press that health was getting, and in particular GP practices. Okay, the demand that, um, uh, you know, that the patients were advised to demand a face to face appointment and um, that that sort of campaign. But I think that that's slowly turning as we start to have an honest conversation with um, our residents and our patients about how much demand is now outstripped. Um, and the the impact of that and and i know last week mike uh, and my colleague uh, gary young had a second um meeting with with local councillors facilitated by fiona phillips and that's um part of a, a a really growing mature conversation about how as a city um we start to think about different ways in which we can interact with our citizens and make sure people are getting um the the right the right care um, at the right time, um, but there's there's no doubting that this this is a really difficult situation. Um, so you you would expect us also at this point in time to be in super planning mode around future strikes um, and, and and the impact of that, particularly with our ambulance colleagues and NHS one one one, and we're waiting national national guidance on on that. 
Um, but that said, I put a slide in here that actually talks about the activity that we're delivering um, with our Vale of York GPs. And it is over and above um, what we saw pre-pandemic. Um, yes, the balance has changed from more telephone consultations um, versus face-to-face, -face, but it's the only way that we're going to um, manage this, this extra demand. And even then, we're, we're only just barely um, keeping our heads above water. But as you can see, that, that final statistic, our practices now are delivering 87% of their activity in face-to-face -face appointments. Um, so uh, I, I, I do think that, you know, and, and that actually represents the 100% of, of the activity that we were seeing in October 2019. So we're absorbing with, um, we are absorbing with the telephone consultations, some of this extra demand. I, I, I know it's not um, always able to, to meet everybody's expectations, particularly about routine weights, but we are we are managing. I can see Mike's eager to come in. Well, I just wanted to point out that one of the things that happened in the pandemic was this shift to, to e-consultations. And, and if you've accessed your practices, you'll have noticed that you can do it online now. Um, and one of the things that is is an interest is interesting to note is this you'll see at the top there says GPAD, GPAD data, GP access data. Um, it hasn't really caught up with that. So that is not actually measuring the level of e-consultations that happen as well. So the, the figure for 2022, I would suggest, is significantly higher than the 487429. And therefore, the difference is way higher than the 40,000 that is suggested there. So whilst this demonstrates activity has gone up, I think it's gone up more than this. At, at the moment, the, the, the NHS data systems are just not able to, to, to measure that. So I've had conversations actually today with uh, regional leads um, in the NHS about how we perhaps might pilot in York um, a, 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 a way of measuring GP data more accurately um, to, to, to give us a better understanding of the pressures on, on the system. Um, and just coming back to the bottom figure, you know, 87% face to face, I think we all saw, um, and you'll all remember it at the beginning of the pandemic, we shifted almost wholesale to remote consultations. Um, and the pendulum has swung back, but I think it's finding a sweet spot. There, were, you know, pre-pandemic, we were definitely seeing people face-to-face -face who probably didn't need or actually didn't want to be seen face-to-face. -face. You know, particularly with our younger demographic, they're quite happy having remote or e-consultations. In fact, prefer it. So I think that 87% that might well be where things settle down. And, and I, think, I think that's actually a positive because as you can see from the bottom, um, we potentially do get a bit of extra capacity by not seeing people face to face. Thanks, Mike. So I've touched upon some of the stats around urgent care and just the demand being seen by our practices. And you did ask me to, to talk about access to, to primary care. So um, I do just want to touch upon um, the notable addition in York in that we are welcoming our um, first cohort of asylum seekers. It's not the first cohort, actually, for, for those who were about in, in 2019. We have the Mercure on, on the A19, that, but they were single males, um, and they were in and around, uh, I think we saw over a period of a year, 140 individuals um, uh, pass through that, that hotel as their interim accommodation. Um, but we are working. So our first asylum seekers joined us on the 1st of December. <clears throat> uh, we, we, we took no comfort in that the Home Office said it would be full by Christmas. Um, I, I think it will be full tomorrow, um, um, given the pressures that you're hearing to, to, to move people around the system into more appropriate accommodation. Um, so again, our GPs from its existing staff base have pulled together a bespoke service to support those individuals. So we are doing emergency triage to make sure that we understand their immediate health needs. Um, and we're also working very, very specifically to ensure that we understand and mitigate any communicable diseases. Um, and again, you know, uh, what I would say is, is that 
um, our GP practices have worked together through through the through the the um, uh, through the Nimbus format um, to just stand up that service, and, and and we were there from from the first of December, and our public health colleagues from Sharon's team joined us a, um, a, about a, a week later. So um, we're we're really supporting um, those asylum seekers to just make sure that they understand our system that we understand how they access urgent care, that we understand that they understand how our ambulance service works, how access to NHS 111 works, and actually how we make sure that we understand that there's appropriate use of urgent care and, and the emergency department as well. Thanks, Steph. I mean, I think two things I just want to mention. One is, you know, the, the additional demand on a system that's already struggling you know the first of december was four days before the group pay strep surge um and i think it's worth just pointing out that our asylum seeker population um are um have particular needs really quite severe needs i'll use that word in inverted commas things that we're not used to seeing and um i've mentioned it a lot in the press and, and i've already mentioned it today that the, the healthcare professionals that are involved in this are human beings um and um when we see these families it's it's really harrowing actually because they've got they've got a particular set of problems that we don't see they've come from very difficult parts of the world um they've been through incredible trauma personally and and witnessed family members going through incredible trauma they've been bereaved some since they got into the country you know, have lost children, and and actually, um, this is not the same as having a ten or fifteen minute consultation with um, a middle class person in in York who is very well aware and health literate. And um, and I'm not saying the whole population is middle class. And don't don't get me wrong, but um, it is a very different beast. And and this takes up a huge amount of time. It takes up a huge amount of emotional energy. And I've seen some of the more most robust doctors I know and caring doctors I know um, really struggling with this. And, and I don't think that is taken into account when the resources are assessed for um, supplying this sort of service. There's a human a human cost. Um, and, and I take my hats off to the people, you know, that I work with at Nimbus are going down there to, to the hotel in York and, and really dedicating a lot of time to looking after what are a very vulnerable group of people and um they need the care they need it but we're not machines and, and i think we all need to just um take note of that really. thanks mike um so i'll come on to the sort of things that we're doing as a as a an uptick at the end um but i'm just going to invite mike to to talk about and just add some depth to some of the demand pressures that we've that we've already spoken about because actually one of the things that hack the group do really well that, that we're that we're learning from is is the way in which they understand their their own their own data yeah thanks Steph. so this is just a really quick snapshot just to give you i wanted to give you a feel because it's quite hard as steph said some of this is invisible i wanted to give you a feel for the volume of activity that general practice deals with compared to other sectors now that is this is not us looking at, at another sector saying they're not working as hard as us we're all working really hard but i just because they're different cohorts of patients but um this this is um activity in haxby group so we look after about 33,000 patients across the city, mainly across the north, uh, the northwest and northeast of the city. And this is collated data. The left hand graph looks at data collated between April and September. The gray column is the number of calls we get into general practice. The yellow column is the number of appointments we give face to face appointments. And then if you look at how that compares with how many people, how many of our patients go to ED, the orange block, and how many ring 111, it just gives you a feel for the enormity. Now, the scale you see in the middle refers uh, to both graphs, actually, because the, the, the left graph is average data. Um, so, um, you know, we're talking 12,000 calls a month. OK, just let that sink in a little bit. You know, that's one practice representing 15 15 percent of the city, something like that. Is this specifically just York, Mike, or is it including homes? Yeah, this is York. This is, this is York, Haxby yeah. Group York. So it's an enormous figure. And 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 that's you know so we will deal with some sometimes three four hundred calls before lunchtime, 
So the average number of tenants in, in ED might be about 150, something like that. Um, so that's for the whole city, not just for our patients, obviously. So I just wanted to, 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 to let you see that because the volume of activity that the teams get through is staggering. Um, and what you'll see there across April to September is it doesn't really, there's not really any seasonal variation. So um, I, I'm still waiting to, to, for the team to produce the, 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 the last quarter data. It might go up a little bit, particularly with the strep A surge, but um, the point is that the demand is there 12 months of the year and the teams are working hard 12 months of the year. And that is on a backdrop of, you know, a national shortage of GPs. You know, we were having conversations with Mr. Hunt when he was health secretary in 2015, asking for 6,000 more GPs. We need more now than we did then. Um, and what's happened in general practice is our teams have evolved and, and because we've been able to recruit pharmacists and what we call um, advanced clinical practitioners and physician associates, um, the multi-professional team has, has developed and they've been brilliant. You know, they really are good. And I guess there's a message for the public. You know, if you went back to the 80s and 90s, probably 90% of consultations in general practice would be with a GP. Now it's probably in the region of 40 to 45%. And if I look at my staff across the whole of Haxby Group in, in, in Humber in North Yorkshire, about 37% of our clinicians are doctors. The rest are nurses, healthcare assistants, advanced practitioners, pharmacists, and, and physician associates. So we've got a much more diverse team. And, and frankly, that's one of the reasons we're being able to keep up with demand. There's no doubt we need more doctors. Um, and, and, and again, I'll just put that in a national context. Um, we get 28,000 applicants to medical school each year in the UK um, for seven and a half thousand places. When we get to GP stress specialist training, there are 4,000 places per annum available. Um, and only 53% of those are filled by UK graduates. The remaining 47% come from overseas. So just to put that into into some sort of context. And what's worse is that those overseas graduates are not evenly distributed around the country. So for example, in London, only 7% of GP trainees would be international medical graduates. In Hull, it's 75%. So that's brilliant that we get, um, we fill our training schemes with amazing doctors, but they come with a different set of challenges. And, and um, we gotta, we've got to adapt our systems to that because we need to, train and retain those doctors um, in order to treat the, the clinical needs of our patients. There's a thing in, in, in general practice called the inverse care law. Um, it was uh, coined by a GP called Julian Tudor Hart in the 80s. But what it suggests is that the areas with the greatest need um, have, have, have the greatest healthcare needs, have, have, have a, a slightly inferior service and don't get what they really need. And we definitely see that. That's live. It's alive and kicking right now in, in the more deprived areas of our ICS. So I said I'd finish on a positive now. Um, so our practices are working together um, to just respond to some of these, um, well, unplanned things. They're, they're, they're not things that you ever truly anticipate or in the numbers. So we're working with our public health colleagues and communications around the uh, group strep A uh, surge that we're seeing. And, and that's predicted to continue, um, particularly until the schools break up. Um, so uh, that, that's what we see. And, and, and actually um, what we've done across the, the city is uh, support the grouping of um sites so that we can run hot clinics so in, infectious children can can be seen in a in a in a more intense way um mike may talk about that you you um it's an it's an add-on to the to the children's hub um which was an admissions avoidance scheme that um we kept going for for two days but but uh, colleagues from York Trust and, and our general practices have increased that to, to five days. So under a set of clinical criteria, instead of going to the hospital, um, uh, parents and children can, can go to, to Ascom Bar. Um, there's also a link to that um, a development of a, around adult respiratory hubs as well. And they kind of are going hand in hand with the, the children's hubs and we're 
uh, dotting those ar around the city. Again, so the Practices can pull resources, but also that we've got centers of expertise that um, can try and manage the demand, but also at the same time, uh, look to keep people out of the physical place that is York Hospital. Um, so we're trying to work in, in partnership across that. And then together with system partners, every year we do a winter plan that tests and pumps money into additional schemes, depending on what the pressures are. And they tend to, to concentrate on pre-hospital work, which is through our general, general practices, um, in hospital work, which is around about flow, making sure that people don't get to hospital where there are alternative services and then discharge. So how we get people out of hospital at the right time when they are uh, medically fit to, to, to go home or to an alternative place. Um, that's quite challenging, not crack that, not yet, but we are all working together to manage that, Mike. Right. So, um... I've been trying quite challenging up to now. I'm going to be quite positive now and talk about what we're doing in York that I think is 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 really sort of cutting edge in terms of how general practice operates. So the Nimbus Care model, where the GPs come together um, to do things at scale, is different. It's not happening everywhere. It's happening in some places, but I think we've we've we're doing some things that are interesting. And you know, I won't go over the the vaccination centre thing. We've talked about that a lot. Um, but I, what I will do is talk about something called Opal 2.5. So you, you, you remember the Opal scoring systems we put in place, um, a system with the support from Steph and Gary Young, this concept of Opal 2.5, where we would have um, staff available to put into practices um, when they, they, they were in, on, the, on the cusp of going from Opal 2 to Opal 3. Um, and that worked really well. It did prevent... Um, um, practices getting into that situation of extremis and and actually that was a case report in the fuller stock take you remember you might remember that that's been a, a national review of general practice so that that was recognized at that level so really positive stuff um if you go think about the the the, the, the strep a situation um last wednesday so the, the the surge started at the beginning of last week last wednesday gary and steph and others managed to get a little bit of resource together to help um, put in some extra clinics. The practices were able to get together on the Thursday morning, and by Friday we'd gone live with a, with additional urgent care hubs across the city. Um, so we, we we put three hubs um, in, into place with additional appointments, and we'd also expanded um, the children's hub at Askham Bar. Um, so these community care centres that again Steph has helped us develop. Um, Askham Bar has been invaluable. We, we, again, we won't rehearse its impact during the vaccination program, but the recovery from COVID, Askham Bar is really important. So um, we're, we're running the children's hub from there. You might have noticed the slight false start the government made in announcing the community diagnostic um, hubs um, last week. Um, Askham Bar is mentioned in that. You'll see that on the gov.uk website. So that, that that's the community diagnostics, Christian, that I was talking about earlier quicker access, community access to diagnostics. We're hoping to be one of the first 19 in the country to go live with that. There'll be others around the ICS. I think there's one mentioned in Selby on that on that um, press release. I think more details still to come out about that because it's not quite as it was portrayed. Um, we're running health, health checks at Askham Bar. We're running other services in collaboration um, with the trust uh, around uh, conditions such as heart failure. We're running diagnostic tests, spirometry, things that are a long waiting list that has built up during the pandemic. And we're also housing the medical elective suite there. They're, the hospital are trying to relocate that, but we're now housing that at Askham Bar whilst building work takes place at the community stadium. And that's going to be there until at least the middle of the year. So you've now taken, and you deserve credit for this, you've taken a disused car park um, in the city and you've turned it into an invaluable health hub. We're now having patients down there having blood transfusions and other intravenous medication. Um, and what we're demonstrating is the art of the possible. Um, and, and I really hope that can, that can continue for as long um, as possible. We've got a second um, community care centre at um, Acom Garth. So again, that was taken NHS property that wasn't being used to its maximum, to its potential. Um, again, Steph's played a, a huge role in this. And we've we've revamped it. Um, Nimbus Care recycles any money that it um, generates from these contracts back into the system. We've refurbished it. 
And we're now hosting a whole raft of different services in collaboration with private providers like Yorkshire Health Solutions, who deliver NHS contracts for ultrasound, the trust and public health. You know, the, the range of services are great. And, and this really is integrated care in action. You know, this is what the new NHS reforms really are designed to do. We've got a couple of other community care centres in the pipeline. So we're working with Steph again on Monkgate. Um, you'll be aware of that premises and we're hoping to have that up and running in the middle of 23. And we're also working with colleagues in St. Leonard's Hospice and um, our practices in the east to develop something similar in Pocklington on the, on the site of uh, the Pocklington surgery. So collaboration, working together, thinking outside the box, doing things differently, um, 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 I think is, is beginning to reap rewards. And I can get really positive about this because I think we have to do stuff like this. If we don't do it, the current, if we keep doing things the way we've always done them, we're going to run into problems. Thank you very much. Um, before I open to, to questions, um, I've got several questions myself, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll refrain from asking most of them for now when I let colleagues ask theirs first. Um, I've got a few challenging questions, a few bit, bit naughty possibly. Um, uh, and and then I'd, I'd I'd like to express a few positive aspects as well. Um, but um, I'm going to open something with something more about um, the transformation and the changes in the system, rather than the specifics of what you've presented. So obviously, it, it and it links with how the ICB has come about, basically. So. Um, we've, we've seen obviously quite a number of transformations or changes to the system in, in recent years. So in, in, 20, in 2000, when Labour were, were in government, so there was the launch of the primary care trusts. And it's not paraphrasing, these are actually little statements from within the launches at the time. So when, when, they, when that was launched, we were told um, that there would be work with local agencies to tackle health inequalities, improve public health. Then when the coalition government launched the health and well-being boards in 2011, we were told they would provide a forum where political, clinical, professional and community leaders from across the health and care system come together to improve the health and well-being of their local population and reduce health inequalities. And then, um, as you referred to a little while ago with Jeremy Hunt in 2015, with the launch of STPs, and then we were told they would be bring together local NHS organisations and local authorities, uh, county and unitary councils to develop proposals to improve health and quality of care to provide. My question is, with a, another change with the ICB, um, what will the ICB doing, be doing differently and what lessons have been learned from what presumably are examples of potentially failed collaboration if we're seeing another change now? Yes, I'll go. I'll go first. Because um, I did actually reference that I had worked in the NHS for 32 years. So um, I've lived and breathed those statements. Um, and I think ultimately you need system change to just allow local transformation. So what I do know about the ICB is that one of its statutory duties is to address inequalities within its six places. Um, and, to, and it's one of the areas where they've ring fenced funding. So we are seeing that uh, develop. But as I say, I genuinely think that transformations happens at place. So the CCG as was, we, we did make an appointment uh, for a joint post for, for a public health consultant. So Peter Roderick, as you know, is employed, um, is employed and hosted by, by help, um, but actually works collaboratively. Um, and that was one of the, the, the joint posts. Um, so Peter and I work together on those local activities um, and if he was here he would he would much more eloquently list all all the, the things that they that 
they and, and our team are working on. Um, but I do want to highlight, uh, actually, the work of the York Healthcare Collaborative, because that is a partnering organisation, and they've just done quite a significant piece on the on how we respond in in health and other agencies around around the cost of living. So that's being shared at, at the at the ICS level as well. Now, Mike will come on to this point. I am sure. And the reason why I'm saying um, we have to do this at place is that if we're sat in and among six places uh, talking about health inequalities, we have to adopt a different language because there'll be other places in our ICS where health inequality in a traditional way completely outstrips um, the, the, the sort of conversation that we can have in health, um, uh, in York rather, sorry. Um, so that, that's the point I would make. Um, and it's in some respects from a personal perspective, in spite of multiple organizational changes that happen frequently, actually the, the, the bedrock of what we're trying to achieve happens at place through, through the partnerships uh, and, and building upon uh, what we already have. Um, you might have got a different response if Stephen Eames was here, but but I'm kind of like, it's happening in place and it needs to happen in place in spite of multiple changes. Um, I mean, you're getting an answer here, Councillor Deputy, from a frontline GP. So I, I'm not a politician and I'm not responsible for wholesale system change. Um, what we do is do what we do in spite of all of that. Um, but I do have some views on it. I think, you know, what you're if we think about the health system, it's what we call a wicked problem. So there is no perfect solution. If you asked a thousand people, you'd get a thousand different answers in terms of what the solution, what the problem was. And you'd also get a thousand different answers in terms of what the solution is. The reality is we have to keep moving. We have to keep trying different things. And, and, I, and I hear people talk about cycling. You know, if you go from strategic to regional to local, and then we've gone back. And, and people go, oh, you know, we're just going round and round in circles. We're not. Times change, environments change, political situations change. We're trying different things to meet the needs of our population. And, you know, I take a very pragmatic, accepting view of the fact that systems change. I wish we didn't have a party political system for health, frankly, because what you get is every time you get a different flavour of government, you get a different way of doing things. And, and, and you know, I've seen that in my 20 odd years in the, in the health system. So I wish we did have a cross party um, you know, group that focuses on health commissioning and health design, healthcare system design. What I have seen is siloed working. You know, the the um, the, the Lansley reforms and and you know the CCG era brought in a competitive market into health uh, healthcare, and we saw um, organisations and sectors withdrawing into themselves to win contracts. And I think part of what we're seeing today is the consequence of that. If you ask, you know, that's my personal opinion, and I love the fact that we're now moving on from that and starting to recognize that we've got to work together to do things. And by that, I mean health and social care. You know, so I think the place boards, the ICS is, is, is probably moving in the right direction. Um, but of course, what we've seen over the last year is a little bit of paralysis as these things come together and form and understand new sets of rules. And, you know, I don't think they've really got into gear yet. In fact, they definitely haven't got into gear yet. Um, and I suspect Stephen would tell you that. Um, where I think we've seen big gains is where you empower groups of people to do things locally. You know, one of the, my criticisms of the NHS is that it's very top down. We get told how to do things. I think if the question was different and, and it was asking local systems, how would you like to do things and to get NHS support to do that, um, we, we, do for, we do much better. I mean, you've seen that with Nimbus K. You know, we've taken a lead, we've done things at risk, we've, we've given solutions to the system. And thankfully, the system has backed that in the majority of cases. So I think it is um, important. You talked about health inequalities, but I think we've seen evidence of how the York system has, has tried to address health inequalities across our region. Um, you know, the two clear examples are York Trust um, supporting Scarborough and, and incorporating Scarborough. You know, Scarborough is, is a very deprived area with w much worse healthcare outcomes than we have here in York. So I applaud that move. And in fact, I was delighted 
to be able to mirror that with Haxby Group when at the beginning of the pandemic, the now chief operating officer of the ICS when, when she was the accountable officer in North Yorkshire, asked us and Haxby Group to go and have a look, go and support a practice in Scarborough because we'd done the same in Hull a decade earlier with pretty good success. And we did that and we went across and now we've brought that practice into the overarching Haxby Group system. So, you know, there are really good examples of where we've gone and supported health inequalities up the East Coast. Um, but I think Steph's right in terms of how we articulate the health inequalities in our own city and all that we get our fair share of resources. You know, we are, if health inequalities are the focus, it's quite easy to suggest that um, all the health inequalities are down the East Coast, you know, Scarborough, Bridlington, Hull, Grimsby, Scunthorpe, York, Harrogate, you know, we have to articulate in a different way. And maybe that's focusing on uh, child health, maybe that's focusing on, focusing on mental health, frailty. Um, you know, we just have to, we just have to reframe the problem. Um, and, and I think we're starting to do that. Hello, Chair. It's Jamela here, uh, and I was just wondering if, I'm not sure if you can see our hands, so myself and Councillor Jefferson have got our hands up just to, to come in, if we may. Yes, yeah, of course. I, I, I can't, uh, we, we can't see any hands here, so uh, we'll allow you, uh, I'll, I'll go through the, the people that I understand we've got remotely first before I go around the room here. I think that would that'd be the fairest thing to do and give an opportunity to... So, you know, I've got an Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, J Jamela, do, do you want to? Uh, is there something you'd like to say first, and then I'll pass on to Councillor Jefferson, and then uh, I'll go through the other the other um, partners that are on online remotely first, see if they have any questions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to 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 come in if you don't mind, and I think. I think one of the, the differences, I think, with the ICS that has come about um, is the much closer working with the local local authorities now. You see our chair uh, of our place board is Ian Floyd, who is the, the chief officer uh, in, in the council. And we, have, we do have that slightly stronger voice. Could the social care voice be a bit louder within health? I think absolutely. And it's about how we make sure that we use um, and work with the scrutiny committee to make sure that, you know, the the ICS strategy uh, is delivered and how it's delivering well at a place uh, level. And also the place board is actually delivering the right services. You talk about health inequalities uh, and Mike is um, absolutely right. York does have uh, a number uh, of challenges itself. If you look at our national data, as Sharon would say, it, we look very good on paper, but we actually, when we come down to um, a place level, a ward level, an individual level, we do have uh, significant challenges with um, inequalities and also equal access to services. So I think as we go through uh, and looking at that governance, making sure that from a uh, a local perspective and a scrutiny perspective we we um ensure that it's delivered locally otherwise it, it will it can be too wide but i think the opportunity here with the ics is and i'm really pleased to see the other councils from other areas have joined us today is about how we can equally share that learning and use some of that good practice locally chair yes thank you jamela um Councillor Jeffers from East Riding of Yorkshire Council, have you got a question for colleagues? Yes, I'm, I'm Councillor Barbara Jefferson from the East Riding Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed your presentation this evening. It's been very helpful. Um, I think Stephanie Porter sounds a star. However, um, it's just a couple of little things I've picked up. Obviously, it's the first time I've ever sat and listened to one of these. At the beginning of the uh, presentation, Professor Holmes, I believe it is, um, said that patients deteriorating, waiting for surgery. Do you know if they know how to contact anyone if they feel they are deteriorating? Because I'm not sure from my health and wellbeing board whether anybody's ever mentioned it before. And it's something I'd really like to know so that I can pass it on. That's one question. And the second one, I'm afraid, again, was 
this, for Professor Holmes, sorry, but I was listening very intently to you. Um, I'm not so sure that patients do like this 15 minute conversation on a telephone rather than face to face with their GP. I think this is rather a, a personal choice. And it's something we have to live with, but it's not something that we necessarily want to get used to. Those are the sort of two questions, but I really would like to congratulate you on the Nimbus Care in York. This sounds fantastic. Um, pity we haven't got something like that in the East Riding, because to go out and help surgeries when they've got problems, lack of staff, etc., must be really, really helpful to our GP surgeries. But that's really what I wanted to say, but I would like, you know, just a couple of answers, if you don't mind. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Yeah, um, so um, I'll take your three questions um, in order. So access, so, so do patients on waiting lists know who to contact? Well, um, the bottom line is that they can contact their GP and that's what has been happening um, ordinarily. This, the service that we've put in place is proactively contacting them and asking the question, are they okay? So I, I think that's the difference and, and I hope I hope that's helpful. But otherwise, it would if you don't have a, a, a similar service, the, the, the answer is contact the GP. Um, well, we don't, we don't have a similar service and I think that sounds fantastic and it's something I think that we should do in the East Riding. Hmm. Um, in terms of your other point around, you know, not liking remote consultations, mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. This is a personal choice. Um, and, and when I talked about the pendulum swinging back, you know, we've got back to 87%. So, you know, 87% of people are choosing to have face-to-face -face consultations. But definitely, definitely, there is a cohort of the population who are quite happy and prefer to have um, remote consultations. And these might well be working age adults who don't have long-term multiple morbidities you know they're quite fit and healthy healthy usually and they have something that they want to talk to their doctor about that's not life-threatening it's just um you know and and for them it makes perfect sense and we're seeing these um uh, the, the the requests for this pop up all over the country actually um what we are doing though is 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 increasingly having to triage patients and that might involve a phone call um mm -hmm. because we just simply can't offer everybody a um, face to face, otherwise we'd be we 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 just couldn't physically do it. So uh, there may be a temporary element of that. That as we recover from the pandemic and dare I say, um, things settle down. I'm not sure. Um, I might have to regret saying that. I'm not sure. Maybe that will never happen. But if that happens, then maybe we can revert to a slightly different system. Um, in terms of a Nimbus care like vehicle, actually, you do have something similar in the East oh, Riding. Yeah. It's called Yorkshire Health Partners. So I would really um, encourage you to have a, have a conversation with them. There, that you know, the, the the difference between the East Riding and York is, of course, the size of the of the area. The geography mm -hmm. is very different. York is is quite compact. And, and it may well be easier for us to do some things, but Yorkshire Health Partners are doing um, so, some, some really good work there. And, and, I, and I would encourage you to, to, to reach out to them. I think I think we definitely should, because it's quite clear that if, if we have a surgery that has a problem, because many of our doctors are part time, I mm. think it would be great for them to know at least somebody's going to come in and help. Uh, and that's not something that I have seen anywhere or heard about. And I have been. Mm with health now for many, 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 well, too many years to mention. Um, Yorkshire Health Partners actually are doing something really good with um, uh, antiviral medication for, for patients with COVID. They're, they're supporting um, the triage of those call, calls to decide who, who might get um, antiviral medication. So um, right. reach out to them. They're doing some good stuff. Yeah, that, that, that sounds absolutely marvellous. Thank you very, very much for that. And, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask questions, because if we don't ask what we find or um, think are silly questions, we never get to know what are good questions. And it sounds to me as though York's getting it right, because I live in Hornsey. I'm along the coast, but you never know. You never mentioned it. <laughs> well, thank you for mentioning it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much uh, for joining us, Councillor Jeffers. I know Hornsey very well. Oh, you're, 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 you're lucky too. Yeah, wonderful place, wonderful yeah. place. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have Councillor Bayram online from, uh, from also from East Riding? Do you have a question you'd like to ask at all? Right, okay, that, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, Simon Bell, who's the Interim Place Director for the York Health and Care Partnerships, 
Good evening, Simon. Evening. Um, uh, I was going to give a, a response um, to your question, Councillor Doughty, which was an interesting one. Um, in support of my colleagues, um, Mike and uh, Steph in the room, I think, you know, legislation, you're right, over the past uh, 25 years, it's changed and changed again, and uh, it's promised a lot, but delivered not much. So what that means to me is legislation isn't the answer. Now, 15, 15 years ago, uh, I was working in an organisation down in the southwest, which was fully integrated. It delivered community, GP, adult social care, continuing health care services in one model with one integrated team and with one information system to support staff when they talk to patients, such that when staff talk to patients, everybody involved in their care understood that conversation. And that was 15 years ago. The organisation itself started 20 years ago. The point being, there's always been sufficient flexibility in legislation to enable us to integrate and work together. Therefore, the question is, if it's not the legislation, what is it? And I think it's something that Mike touched on um, earlier, which was around, you know, just, just finding the opportunities and having the will to do something. And that, that crucially is the difference. This legislation, this uh, Health and Care Act 2022, if we don't take different steps now, next year and the year after, in five years' time, we'll be in exactly the same place. So I think we've got to, we've got to ask ourselves, what are we going to do differently this time? Because the legislation isn't going to make us, because it's always been there with sufficient flexibility to enable us to integrate. I've worked in that way. It doesn't work here. I think the solutions are with us. So it's, it's not waiting for the legislation. It's, it's looking around the room and thinking, why hasn't it happened yet? And do you, do you have any suggestions for why it hasn't happened yet, Simon? Well, when I worked in, in Torbay Care Trust, it was the will of the chief exec of the council and the chief exec of the primary care trust at the time to wrap their services around individual patients and not to let things get in their way. So having people who are focused and driven and committed to an ideal to work better for patients seems to be, in my experience anyway, an important factor. If people want to find a way not to do things, then the legislation will permit that. Thank you, very interesting. Um, does anyone have any questions for Simon? Well, specifically Simon, or different questions. Right, okay. Um, is Christine Phillipson still on the line from North Yorkshire County Council? I am indeed, yes. Good evening, Christine. Uh, is there anything you'd like to, to say or? Um, nothing that, that, that that's um, specific. We, we did have Wendy Balmain, who's the place director, um, come to our scrutiny of health committee meeting um, three or four weeks ago and gave us a presentation on the on the new um, place and integrated care system and that was really really useful um, the, the only one thing I'd like to pick up on and I think it is um, really quite important speaking as a, a parent of a, a young adult um, this this whole idea that everybody wants to have a face-to-face -face appointment is is definitely not the case and I just think and I've thought this for quite some time having having used the online diagnosis through COVID for everybody um, but that, that that sort of age group that's all they know and I just think that there perhaps is a big risk somewhere along here that if that isn't continued and, and, and the different solution isn't made available for the different types of, of people wanting to access, access it, it could be a big risk that we actually miss people who just simply have not got the inclination all the time or just do not want to have a face-to-face -face appointment and they want to do it virtually. I, I really do think that that's a big risk that we need to sort of just keep an eye on really. Thank you. Mike? I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and, you know, I think from where I sit in general practice in, in well, actually quite, quite a number of places across the ICS, I can assure you that we, we, that, that option will not be um, removed. I think we're, we've got to the point now where, um, uh, you know, the technology is going to um, uh, improve and improve and improve. And so I, I cannot see that happening. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I'm working on with Jamela actually is, 
um, you know, online CBT for, for adolescents with mental health problems and, and commissioning a service for that. Um, so, you know, I think we're, we're embracing this technology um, for the right uh, cohorts of our population. And, 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 but, you know, every time we talk about using technology, there's always the counter, well, you know, my, my mum can't use it. And, and we know that, you know, when we absolutely categorically know that there, that there is not one size fits all here. Um, and, 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 you know, I like to think that the, the systems are mature enough to recognize that. And, and for every, you know, for every bit of technology we, we, we put in place, there's always an alternative mechanism in place for, for others that can't use the technology. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Christine. And just I'm just going to come in there because that's that's kind of the positive that I wanted to touch on when I mentioned earlier on uh, from from my own experience. And um, it started as a bit of a negative, actually, but in the end, it turned out to be a positive. <laughs> Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll briefly um, explain the circumstances. So um, about a year ago, I had a fall and I uh, hurt my shoulder, upper arm. And um, as a typical bloke, I thought, oh, it'll be fine. And it, I left it for months. And um, to the point where in the spring, I was still it was still disturbing my sleep. So um, I went into my GP practice and I'm with one of the larger of the practices um, within York and um, tried to make an appointment and uh, with, with the receptionist at, um, at the practice that I'm registered with and I was turned away. Um, I didn't give an indication of who I was. I didn't say I'm from the health scrutiny committee or anything like that. Um, but uh, I was told I would have to um, make an appointment online. Um, and that that did give me some concern because I thought, you know, had this been an older person or someone that wasn't able to um, to you know use that technology in the way that you know, I'm not I'm by no means IT literate myself, but I can imagine a lot of people might have struggled with that whole concept of ha having to try and do something on online and. And, and I did think it was a bit of a performance. I have to say the, the process I went through online as well. Um, but in the end, um, within about 10 days, um, I got an appointment and actually it was for not with my own practice. And this is where the Nimbus Care um, actually scheme if, or whatever you want to describe it as uh, came into, into what I think is a really positive thing for York. So um, I was referred to a different practice of which I was able to attend. Um, and again, that's another issue that some people might find it difficult to attend other practices, but I am mobile. Um, so it wasn't an issue for me. And I actually was seen by a musculoskeletal specialist. Um, so in it turned out, you know, really positive experience uh, from that. So uh, there's definitely um, some some gains from the, the, the way the, the system's going. But I do think there needs to be some safeguards, certainly for people that don't have the ability or knowledge to perhaps work the system. Yeah. I, and again, I'm going to not, not do anything and absolutely agree with you. I, I think it can be quite daunting when you when you're asked to use um, an online system that that you've not used before. And what I would say is that most of them are quite intuitive. And the other thing that we've looked at and I've, and Councillor Hook and I have had, had this conversation about how we provide training and education for patients. Um, and we've done it to a certain extent. We did it. Um, you'll remember the um, NHS app that we all got familiar with getting our COVID vaccination certificates from. Um, we put on, um, we, we had a member of staff in, in our Haxby branch who would um, sit and talk elderly patients or any patient actually through how they downloaded it, how they got it set up. And actually we've talked about doing something similar for our clinic system, which is our, which is the e-consultation system that most practices use in, in York. So um, that hasn't happened yet, but we're working on it. And, and, and I think, um, maybe we'll see more of that. You know, I, I think that, that we've got to educate people to use these things. But our, our younger patients tend to do it intuitively. And, and so it's about targeting the education. I think. I, I think I would like to acknowledge that we've had some turnover in our staff group. 
uh, particularly for receptionists. Um, if we were here last year, we'd have been talking about how the pressure of the role, the abuse that they were getting uh, was meaning that they were taking themselves off to work at Aldi or Lidl because the, the the salaries were, were comparable. So I definitely think there's something for us about uh, reinstating some of our training programs uh, for, all, for all of our uh, uh, particularly uh, administrative staff. Um, because actually, I, we moved so quickly with some of that online work that they didn't keep pace. Um, there's a lot of new services, um, certainly expansion around extended hours. We need to know to know about that. And we are gathering these 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 lessons. So we learned from COVID uh, um, around general text messages, um, young people or or people who don't have. Uh, contracts for their mobiles they frequently change their mobile provider and therefore their numbers change and if they infrequently access uh, our primary care services then practices may not have the up-to-date number um, there's something about getting a, a random text from the NHS and not knowing whether it's real or a scam um, some of the providers from uh, that use an IT provider come from Cinnamon Healthcare. I don't know how I'd feel if if I got a text from Cinnamon Healthcare. So we, we're learning these things and trying trying to adapt, trying to adapt very very quickly. And we're really keen to work with our local authority partners on on how we support the agenda around digital exclusion. So, you know, we're moving in that direction and the whole of the society is moving in that direction, but we shouldn't leave anybody behind. So um, it's really helpful that I that I hear that 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 experience. Um, you, it, it probably doesn't come as a surprise that I'm the person that all the really difficult complaints um, come to. So I, I they're small numbers, fortunately, but they I take them seriously because if people have um be motivated enough to write to me then then they probably had a fair few hurdles to get over before before they come to me so the 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 point about making sure that we're supporting people and particularly those in every interaction counts when they come into a practice that that's probably something that we need to devote a, a, a bit of a bit of time to mike with the training hub thank you can i make one more point Catherine? just about technology and we tend to focus technology or when we talk about technology in healthcare, we focus on how you access the system. But there are so many other things that have evolved recently that I think it's just worth pointing out. You know, things like sick notes. We can now text or email sick notes to patients, which means they don't have to come in. And that creates, the efficiencies that that creates are significant. Prescriptions. You know, all prescriptions go seamlessly and electronically to pharmacists now that are nominated by patients. You know, in my 20 years in York, that is one of the, the big sea changes of how um, healthcare is organised. Um, nothing's ever perfect, but that's pretty good. Repeat dispensing, I think, is another one. So I, I, I think we just have to, if we look at things in the round, um, and you know, it's easy to look back with um, rose-tinted spectacles and say like the, the systems back then were better. They really weren't actually. The, the the advances that we've made are significant and i don't you know if we were if we were doing things the way we did them in the 90s and the noughties with the demand we've got today without these technological advances it would be i'd, I'd dread to think what it would be long thank you very much we'll, we'll go around the table now so councillor bassi councillor warby and then councillor councillor bassi first please thank you chair and thank you for the presentation i think what i gained for it most of all is the focus you both have on practical solutions and I applaud you for it um, and I should say I've had the benefit of talking with you both outside this meeting on challenges in my ward so I've heard quite a lot more than this and there are there are just three and I, I will make them as quick as I can questions uh, relating to this just to try uh, focusing on the practical so the first is you showed us that some practices and primary care centers don't report the regular data, the OPAL data. And I was wondering, can something be done about this? Would it help? Because when you 
mentioned, uh, Mike, the, the business about Opal 2.5, it seems to me that that working effectively would be improved if you were getting all the data from everywhere. So shall I ask the question separately, Chair, or throw them all? So if you do it that way. Yeah, so what, what we tend to see is um, that practices who are ticking along um, don't always report their Opal status because they're reporting one or possibly two. And we default it to, to, to Opal yeah. one. <clears throat> um, in periods like this, we ask them to be more, be more regular with their reporting. But what I would say is that um, myself and, and my team work really, really hard to build a consistent, transparent and honest relationship with our GP practices. Um, it's challenging, uh, but that's what good partners are for. Um, but our practices occasionally are quite suspicious about what we do with that OPAL data, as if we are going to performance manage them, beat them over their head with a stick. So we've still got a bit of work to do to just make sure that people understand that we're respectful with that data. And particularly when national data is produced, that um, I won't use the, 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 the rather uh, fruity phrase that we use about uh, poor data in, poor data out. Um, but we, 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 we've got to start somewhere, but sometimes that data is misrepresented and access is not the same as quality. So um, I, I would, would, would just, just say, say that about the Opal data. And then finally, there's, there's one more thing which has happened. And it's happened for the best of reasons. So um, Mike uh, referenced the fact that our York uh, Opal uh, reporting was um, uh, name checked in a, in a, in a national report. Um, and we're probably three, four years doing that OPAL reporting. It's been a bit bumpy, but it, 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 it's really getting there now and we can rely on it. Um, but more recently, the LMC introduced a similar, a similar but different OPAL reporting. So practices are reporting twice daily, not helpful, done for the right reasons. But because we were already ahead of the game, it's actually a bit, it's a bit of a duplicate duplication so you know we're asking the same people in practice to do things twice and if they don't really value the purpose it's it's uh it's being used for we've 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 just got a little bit more work to do on that i won't repeat anything steph said but what i would say is i think we need to go on a journey with data um to shift it away from the performance management punitive mr javid's league tables culture to a one where we share data for the purposes of quality improvement that has a direct impact on patient care. And I think we probably can all live. You know, you've got to, we've got to be, we've got to give assurance and we, and we need to demonstrate that we're doing what we, what we should be doing. But actually we should be using the data to get better, not to create league tables and be punitive. And I don't know, I don't know, maybe as a system, we can lead on the cultural change from that perspective. But, you know, sometimes we, we can do what we think is the right thing to do, not necessarily what politicians in Whitehall would, would have us do. To briefly respond to that, is there something the council can do to help? Is there a role that we can have to help inspire confidence in that? I definitely think there is, given that um, Mr. Floyd is chairing um, the, the the your place health and uh, care partnership. I think that culture starts in in that room actually, and you know we're starting to have those conversations about you know let's be more open and transparent with our data um, because we we're not worried about what it's going to be useful. We're going to use it for the right reasons. So absolutely, please. I mean that we're we're we're, we're desperate for it really. Good, thank you. Can I ask my second question now. So my second question is about technology. You've both spoken at a certain length about technology and we've spoken previously as well. I just wondered if you could outline a bit more some of the broader opportunities. I'm aware that we had a conversation, uh, Mike, fairly recently 
about 24 hour dispensing machines and things like that. And it, I'd like to kind of <clears throat> get a sense in this context of the opportunities that exist using technologies to transform dispensing and prescriptions to free up staff, if I've understood correctly, to be getting on with other things in GP practices. Well, I've mentioned some of them already, you know, the, with regards to uh, medication, you know, um, the, the, the EPS system where we, where we prescribe and goes directly to pharmacists. Um, you know, I think the way we order prescriptions is, is transformed now. You know, we can use the NHS app to do that, and it's really good. It, it works very well. Um, um, when you go inside a pharmacy, you know, they, they're using, you know, they can use robots to pick medicines off shelves. They're using bar scanners to do stock control. The technology is is phenomenal, actually. And, you know, the vending machine, they're not cheap, these things. But, you know, we, we the, 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 the pharmacy in Haxby has, has managed... Um, to put one in and I'll declare a conflict of interest there. The partners of Haxby um, co-own that, that group of pharmacy with, with pharmacies with a pharmacist. Um, but, but you know, we've put in a, a vending machine and it, it seems to be working really well. It's quite easy to use, although you do have to be IT literate. You know, it involves using QR codes and scanning, using your phone as a QR scanner. So it's not without challenge, but for the right people, it works beautifully. Um, and, and, you know, like I said earlier, Technology advances at a rate of not, so we'll, I'm sure we'll see more and more and more of that. And and it's a good thing. You know, we've got to embrace it. So I'll just touch upon a couple of things which are, are technology, but a bit more low key, a bit more high numbers, low 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 key. Um, so I know Peter Roderick and his team have been doing uh, text messages to to key individuals. Um, and that's with people who they've identified with comorbidities who, as we approach winter, might benefit from just some reminders, some tips around self-help, um, how to access, um, how to access services. Um, and I think, you know, that lower level, just to remind people about how to keep to keep well, where we can we can flex the message. I think that's that's really really important. Um, we did a piece of work as well around just reminding um, uh, people with a, a particular chronic condition that they could pre-order antibiotics because they might be vulnerable over over the winter months. So 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 we we did that as well. People might remember that <clears throat> we distributed pulse oximetry meters, and so people can can self monitor their oxygen levels, uh, particularly. It, uh, it was for COVID, but, but you know, that, that can be rolled out for anybody who might have symptoms of, of low, low oxygen levels. So I, I do think that we're, we're starting sort of slowly and rolling, rolling those things out where, where they're appropriate. And I think we want to do more. Um, you know, my team of four. Uh, we're just limited by 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 our own aspirations for what for what we can do. The point I just quickly make that question is that you know if we ask our kids, if I ask my kids, oh, is technology going to replace us? Well, no, they're not worried about that. Technology enhances what we do, and it's it's a real interesting point that we you know there's so much work to do out there in healthcare, but it's never going to replace receptionists and managers and doctors and nurses and healthcare it's, it's, there's so much to do that technology just makes it easier for us to deal with the, the demand that we face i i will just make one point my um my mom who is 76 is more it literate than i am so let i uh, don't let's fall into the bear trap of of, of imagining the 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 um, there's a level playing field. There, there are so many. If you if if you like it, you're interested in it. You embraced it. You really adopt it. So I, I think it's horses for courses. Thank you. And my last question ties it all up. I hope, and, and uh, I'll be as brief as I can. So communication and trust. And you've both talked a bit about trust, and you've certainly talked, Steph, about getting messages from a source you can trust. 
Um, this is just my practical experience in the past week. I've posted on social media. I'm sure others of us here have done the same. Uh, two residents in my ward. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on the NHS, go and get your jabs, go and get your COVID jabs and so on and so forth. The immediate response is makes it clear that there's a huge amount of confusion. Basically, you get a, if you post something like that on, on, on social media, you get someone saying, ah, oh, yes, but you can't do that, or I've heard you can do that. Um, even when I've posted links to, uh, for example, uh, Nimbus Care and the NHS websites. So I'm just wondering what we can do, the council and uh, healthcare professionals, to improve that messaging because I know that you're under huge pressures to ensure that everyone who can get their COVID jab or their flu jab uh, gets on and does it in order to relieve pressure elsewhere. And it's what can we do better to give residents confidence about the messaging they're receiving so that they can go on and uh, go and get their jabs in this instance, but obviously there are lots of other things. Yeah, you, you asked me that earlier in, in the week and I went away and looked at what, what I had. Um, it was pretty standard NHS stuff where I had to spend a fair amount of time looking at, it was a one page grid, but you couldn't have asked for more information on one single page that you couldn't digest unless you knew a lot about healthcare. So your point was well made. Um, so I, I've got that action to go back. But I, I do think that some of this stuff is cyclical. So if you'd have asked me last year, I'd have been able to point to something because the national team will have specified that we did something. Um, and, and and we've now got Choose Well literature. So I think there's just something about refocusing our attention on what locally we need to do. I think your point's well made. Um, I won't add much to that, Christina. I, I think we can definitely do better. There's no question about that. And I suspect we'll always be able to do better because I suspect we'll never completely crack it. Um, I, I think social media, I've had a bit of a love-hate relationship with social media. I think it works well sometimes. Other times, I think it's um, it's problematic. I think there's a lot of, I guess, negative stuff on there, trolling on there, which is really unpleasant. And, you know, I've certainly seen it, how it affects the morale of staff in, in practices and, and has quite a negative effect. I think it often gives a skewed um uh, opinion you often get one or two people posting on twitter for example and suddenly that's the opinion of york well i'm not sure that's true either you know we did 650,000 vaccinations at asking bar in a year so it was getting through to some people so it's not all wrong it's not all bad as well that's the other side of it but you know that we use lots of other um techniques you know there's websites we use letters we use texts um we use mainstream media you know the press and radio etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think we're trying. Um, I accept it's not perfect. I accept we don't always get it right. And if there's an offer to work with the council, in fact, we are doing that. You know, we work with Health Watch. We're working. Jamela and I have had meetings about how do we get comms better? How do we involve the public more? There's definitely an appetite for that. So let's see what 23 brings. Thank you. Councillor Warby next, time, please. Thank you, Chair. I've also got three questions. Um, so please bear with the first one, because the first one's about stuff you've been talking about. So I might have misunderstood it a little bit, Mike. Um, so you talked about um, basically you were doing things. Um, right. OK, sorry. Is this with all practices? So basically you were doing things within your practice, like um, the Opal 2.5. Can it not be expanded throughout? Is it only in your practice or is it in York? Or Because I didn't quite understand that one. Uh, no, no. Opal 2.5 is definitely for all of York. So it was Nimbus so Care who was putting okay. that, uh, that, that, that into more than uh, into every practice. But it actually it initially it expanded beyond... York itself. It was into okay. the Vale of York in North Yorkshire. Oh, in fact, Nimbus Care is offering support into Hull and into Scarborough. Um, and we're trying to work with colleagues down in, in both of those areas to create um, a, 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 their version of Nimbus Care. 
with our support actually you know we want to support that because um as we as i spoke to um your council colleague uh, earlier there, there's there's a similar entity in east riding there's a similar entity in north links and in harrogate and in Teesside of course. So uh, I, I'm a big advocate of this model, as you probably would guess. And I, and I think every area, every place should have one. And I think we should be working with the ICS proactively um, to create them. My second question is about the on the page commentary on waiting times. Um, on some of the bullet points on the, the bottom of the left-hand side, um, when are they um, likely to start? And my second part of that question is that um, on the, the um, sickness um, and vac um, number of vacancies, what are the current vac number of vacancies and sickness rates and what is being done and what can be done to address this? I'll come back on that. I, I think the specifics on uh, staffing vacancies and retention, I, I don't have and it, it needs quite a fluid position so if i may i'll ask the, are you thinking specifically for for the our acute sector colleagues i i will get that information and, and come back to you it's very very fluid um and particularly when uh different uh particularly covid waves hit um and i i don't know how much interaction you you have in the hospital less so in primary care but <clears throat> Things are when when um, infection rates peak, you often see it in um, staff going back to to mask wearing, uh, limiting visiting, and what have you. So I'll I'll get that data for you, and then and then you asked about the mitigation actions when when they're being implemented. Um, most are implemented to to some extent uh, already. Um, but they are often dependent, new schemes, enhanced schemes over winter, they're often dependent on staff recruitment. So we ten, tend to go through um, a range of actions. Can we do anything with the existing staff, sort of um, incentivize payments over time? If we can't, then who else do we go to? Possibly in the short term, locum staff agencies. Everybody knows that that comes with a cost premium. Uh, and then latterly, uh, we might do something as a system to do um, consistency is the thing that we need the most. Um, and we've got um, uh, Cypher as, a, as an organisation supporting our colleagues at the hospital at the moment with patient cohorting. Uh, so that's an example. So um, where patients might be, um, might come to the hospital, they'll come with Yaz, Yaz will hand them over and there'll be a clinical assessment and then they'll be grouped and supervised before they move through the, the, the system on site and that, that helps with flow, it helps when the physical environment is quite full um, so you know we, we we talk about ambulance weights, trolley weights, but we but but with colleagues we've we funded that that additional specification. I guess the other thing is I just want to come back on on what Mike said about the two point five and just make the practical observation that when you have scarce staffing resources and people work for all sorts of different reasons about with an agency or as locums, often those locum staff are booked for three months, six months in advance. So what happens is the system is, 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 is really fragile when you get something that happens in a short term because you can't go out and access other staff. So I think that's one of the elegant solutions of 2.5, which essentially is a, it, although I'm gonna describe it really inelegantly, it's a local staff pool. So Nimbus have, um, created their own staff pool on the anticipation and the lived experience that it will always be required. Mm. Uh, and so the, the, the practices buy into that as a bit like an insurance policy because they know if they haven't booked a locum, say, for example, to cover maternity leave, they're not going to be able, you won't get a locum for next week for love and money, no matter how much you overinflate the price that you're, because they've already got contractual um, commitments elsewhere. So I just kind of wanted to expand on that. Thank you. If you, I can say something about waiting times in general practice. I think that, were you about to ask that? 
Yeah, so I started through my first question. I wanted to go back. So it's about your waiting list because I didn't write a title on my thing. So I'm like, what was it about? So it was about your waiting list. You were, you were contacting people. Um, is that some in your practice? Is that something you um, that you can expand throughout your? Because I think it's a really good idea. Com communication is key. And everybody wants to know. I mean, if, if someone gets told something, they're not going to keep ringing you going, when is it? When is it? I think it's an amazing idea. So I think we're conflating two, two issues. Um, so the, the, the service that we put in place are for people who are on hospital waiting lists, and it is for everybody across the city. Um, so I hope, does that does that help you understand that 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 that, that is for everybody wherever whichever practice you're in, Nimbus is running a service that proactively contacts people to ask how they are whilst on the waiting list. Um, the other issue that I was going to talk about is routine waiting lists to see a GP or to see a pract a clinician in a GP practice. Um, and as Steph alluded to earlier, what happens when you're under periods of immense pressure is that we. We deal with the urgent demand, the same day demand first. And what that means is that the routine waiting list goes up. And that's what we've seen in hospitals. And the same is happening in general practice. Um, and believe it or not, there's no in hospitals, the, the waiting time is 18 weeks. That's that's the standard that we've come to accept. I'm not sure there was any particular strong evidence behind that when it was introduced, but nevertheless, that's what we expect. Um, in, in, in general practice, there is no real standard for that. There's no evidence to support any standard. We don't know. The research hasn't been done. Um, we've had the government recently trying to say it should be two weeks. Well, of course, that hasn't been implemented because it's just totally unrealistic and unachievable. We tend to work and try to get to around four. So if we have four weeks is a rough standard in our minds, but, base, but be, be mindful that there's no evidence behind that. Um, at Haxby Group, and I can only speak for Haxby Group because this data is is, is personal to practices, I guess, and, and may not be measured in the same way. I think that's important. Because of the system we have, we can look at total demand, and we know exactly how many people have contacted us and are, and are therefore waiting. And at one point earlier in the year, that was as high as 11 weeks. Okay. Now, in and of itself, that sounds a lot to wait for a routine appointment. With the general if you compare it to waiting list in secondary care, it's actually almost half. Um, and way less than half now when you've got people waiting for a year or more. Um, now, it, it, they're not directly comparable, but I'm just trying to put it into context. We've been working really hard with um, our practice, and I know every practice in York has been doing exactly the same, to try and get that waiting time down. And some of that has been supported with resources that um, Steph and Gary have, have provided with us. And at one point, two weeks ago, we had it down to six weeks, um, which is pretty good we're quite pleased with that and we thought if if we continued along that trajectory we'd have it down to around four by christmas or really into the new year but sadly the group a strep situation has adversely affected that so we're we're back up to eight weeks um in york um so you know that that's just a, a, a reality of the current situation but what i can assure people that, and and the public is that um it, it's not something we forget about we're looking at it every day we have the they have the data in front of us every day and where we send tables around all of our stuff every week with the current waiting list, whether it's gone up or gone down and what we're doing about it. So if you need assurance that it's being looked at proactively, it's there. Yeah. Before we come for your next question, unless you've got something else on that, I'd like to ask a supplementary as part of, the, the part of your line of questioning, actually. Um, so, um, over the last couple of years, we're, we're, the, there have been occasions, and I'm speaking specifically about GP access now uh, and, and, and certain surgeries. And um, at the height of COVID, some surgeries had to close because their premises just weren't suitable for you know, in, uh, maintaining social distancing, et cetera, just impracticalities of the, of the venue, if you like. Um, and more recently, we're, we're seeing occasions where surgeries are closed because of the staffing issues, shortages. And um, this, where Mike, you can probably answer this one because I'm, I'm thinking specifically of Haxby Group here and in my own ward, um, stopped the st surgery at Stockton on Forest closed a few weeks ago. Um, and I'm, I'm told it was down to, to staffing. And I think mainly on the 
reception and admin side, but possibly a number, number of reduced GPs as, across the practice as well. I don't know. But um, so, so my, obviously, residents are asking me, uh, and, and I've put the question um, to, to, to your group if pre, uh, recently, asking when it's likely to reopen. And it was a kind of... I didn't get a direct answer, so it might be something you'd be able to answer. Um, there's some concern that because it's a more village, um, semi-rural, if you like, um, that the, the concern that they will lose that facility. And I'm obviously trying to give reassurance that, that that's not likely to be the case, but you might be able to tell me differently. Um, so I'd be interested to know what what the what what you're able to tell me and use in, in that respect, but also. Um, Stephanie, earlier on, you mentioned specifically about um, the wages that are being offered, and you referred to a couple of the budget supermarkets. And the the, the adverts I saw recently for some of the staff for some of the surgeries in York actually were not comparable to um, Aldi and Lidl. They were a chunk less, and actually, literally, only pennies above minimum wage in reality. Um, so I, I wonder whether that is a factor, you know, in, in actually why these surgeries are closed because you can't attract the staff because the wages are so poor. I'd be interested to hear what you say. Okay. There's a lot in that question. There's a lot in that question. So I think um, you're definitely right that um, during the pandemic, there was um, a, a number of branch surgeries were closed and the, and the reasons you quoted were absolutely correct. There was infection and prevention and control reasons. There was consolidation. We were in a very difficult period where we had to do things differently. Um, and what happened during that time is um, we we reorganized. We found that um, uh, the, the reorganization worked um, and, and patients were, were able to find alternate ways to get the service that they needed. After that, we have definitely seen a, a challenge in getting staff and it's 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 multifactorial. So wages is definitely an issue. So we're seeing, you know, huge levels of inflation and we just simply haven't been able to keep up with that. Um, we I don't, not every practice has to pay their staff the same. That's one of the, the, the realities of, of, of the way general practice is organized. My own practice has gone to the real living wage. Um, so that was a 10% increase at the beginning of this current financial year. The government are telling us that the real living wage is going to go up by another pound, 10%. So that's a 20% uplift in a year. The NHS is uplifting our contract, we believe, by about 2.7%. We're not sure of that yet, but we have no certainty. And that's what it's predicted to be in April. So that's a massive cost pressure on, on practices. Um, and we just simply cannot recruit. Steph talked about the, the, the recruitment pressures that we're facing. You know, our patient services team, reception team, is should be 18. It's down at 10 so um, it, it's really, really, really challenging. And then you layer on top of that um, one of the other factors that I think we do have to get out in the open, and I know I've spoken to Anne and others about this, is, is, is the, the relationship between the public and the staff. Um, and it's quite abusive at times. Um, and, and, you know, there's been national publications talking about the number of police incidents and general practice surgeries and the huge rise that we've seen nationally in that. Thankfully, we haven't seen that. We haven't had to call the police, I don't think, to my, to my knowledge. But we see a lot of abuse, you know, swearing. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about this um, uh, to Anne and, and, and other councillors already that, I um, mean, you know, one of my receptionists was told that they were a worthless person with a couple of expletives thrown in for good measure. That's just not acceptable. And what's happening is it's driving people away from wanting to work on the front line of healthcare. You know, these, these people are amazing. They're so committed. They've worked tirelessly through the pandemic. They've put themselves and their families at risk. You know, we, they, they didn't work from home. They were there every day. Um, and, 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 and they're now saying, well, what am I doing it for? I come into work. The workload's un you know, we can't cope with the workload and to cap it all off, we're getting abused by the very people we're trying to help. And that's part of the reason why I've been um, using the media to ask for support and to, to get the message across that we're on the same side as the patients. We're trying, our, we're trying very, very hard to get the services in place with the resources that we've got. And, and there's a mismatch and, and we have to be honest about that. And But to, to come to your point, that's why staff won't work with us. That's why we're having to make difficult decisions about surgeries. 
we're not the only practice who has surgeries closed. Um, and if I'm being honest, Councillor Dachi, I can't, I can't give you the, the, the absolute answer about Stockton, but um, we're thinking about it every day. We're having meetings with Stephanie and, and, and others in the, in, in the NHS about what we can do. Um, but there is a real possibility that it would close permanently, a real possibility. And um, I can't put my hand on my heart and tell you that it won't. Well, that, that's very worrying, I have to say. And I, I completely accept um, it, it's shocking to hear that, you know, some of the abuse that frontline staff have to put up with. And, you know, if, if they're on not little more than minimum wage, why would they? Uh, and that's obviously, you know, proving the case. Um, but it's not really offering much hope. Um, well, I, I, the hope I would offer is that, you know, just because um, a surgery isn't open does not mean we don't care for the patients that are there. And so um, we're looking at what we can do to, to maintain that provision. How do we provide, you know, particularly for Stockton and also for Weldrick, how do you provide alternative um, mechanisms for them to get their medicines? How do we provide better transport routes to get them to the nearest surgery? How do we provide increased provision to do home visits for the genuinely housebound patients who can't get to the surgery? So it's not, I, I wouldn't want to give you the impression that we close the doors and that's that. It definitely isn't that. It's far, far from that. You know, it's what can we do differently mm. that will care for that cohort of patients? Because so, the, the, the worry, additional worrying aspect of it, particularly with the rural communities, they're, they're often older communities. And, and as you point out, public transport's not always the best. Yeah. Um, you know, it can be, well, some of the villages is next to non-existent mm. uh, and no access to, to get into an alternative mm. uh, surgery could be beyond the realms of, of, yeah. of many. But um, be reassured that we're thinking about all of those things. There's nothing you said there that isn't on a list of considerations we have to do. You know, we, we would have to do a, a consultation. We'd have to do an impact assessment. We have to provide alternatives. And, um, you know, we, we are caring healthcare professionals that, that genuinely care for the people who, who live in these villages. What I would also say is, though, if you go around York, there are many, many villages who don't have a GP surgery and cope perfectly well. I live in one of them, Ruffeth, doesn't have a GP surgery. I'd have to go to Poppleton or, or Acom. Um, and there are many elderly people who live in that village and do very well. So, you know, I, I think we have to be, we have to look at the bigger context as well. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Councillor Walby. Thank you. Final question. Um, on your Vale of York GP practice activity data, um, I've got a question. It says um, GP practices are increasingly utilising a range of skilled personnel, including nurse practitioners, paramedics, pharmacists, counsellors, social prescribers, etc. How is this reflected in these figures? Do these figures account for only for GP appointments? Thank you. Yeah, I will do. No, the, the, the activity data on the face to face appointments on the whole will reflect that complement of face-to-face -face visits for the practice. I think my, what Mike um, talked about earlier was that I think um, some of the new ways in which we're working, um, particularly things like uh, the clinic triage where, where you, you, would, you will, will interact, uh, we don't think that that's adequately uh, captured. And some of the um, single point of, of referral services where you might ring and a care navigator will uh, get you to the right place. I don't think that activity is captured as either because it's not neatly boxed as an appointment, but actually it's an interaction. It gets you to the right place. Um, uh, and so I think that that's the piece of work also that uh, that Mike's referencing that we're going to start to see if we can we can do something as a health community um one of the things that's been happening over the summer <clears throat> which is quite um challenging but really important for, for for future delivery of care is that um our four pcns in york city so excluding uh yorkies they've all moved to the same clinical system um, likewise, our community services use System 1 as well. So um, you heard Simon, Simon Bell talk about an integrated care system. Actually, one of the prerequisites for that is a, a, a shared IT system where different professionals can read and write 
into your clinical code so practices have been going some practices in the city have been going through the, through that process which um you know is shifting uh patients onto a new it system clearly not as simple as that uh, uh quite quite difficult um but but um that that's been happening which stands us in good stead for for, for future sharing and the quality of the data because everybody's using the same system Thank you, Councillor Hook, and then Councillor Wells. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I go back to more integrated care again? Because you hear all these stories about beds being blocked because you can't get patients out of hospital into the care system. So you know that there is a relationship there, even though it might not be working perfectly by any means. But is there a similar relationship when you've got a GP who sees someone who doesn't need to go into hospital, but is desperate for care? Because I'm thinking nowadays, there's an awful lot of people like us that live on our own, we haven't got the family network around us. And our GP might be the only person who can get us into care. But it, it's, you know, that side of it. Um, the short answer is yes. So um, <laughs> there's there's something called the York Integrated Care Team, which um, um, was uh, has been in place for about a decade. Actually, Pri Priory Medical Group have, have developed that and and built it up, and it's it's quite a sophisticated um, setup now. Um, and and they will take referrals from GPs um, um, for patients who um, we'd like to put services or aids in in place to prevent admission, and then they follow them up. Um, so um, Nimbus Care are working a little bit with them now, and, and we're offering home visits at weekends for those patients who are in that situation. Um, we're also looking at virtual wards, you know. So um, you know that, that that seems to be um, the, the direction of travel, where we, for specific conditions, we might be able to use technology to monitor um, observations um, and and put in teams of. Uh, professionals to go in and, and keep an eye on people who um, we would normally um, admit to hospital. So I think we need to do that. You know, we absolutely need to do that. Our hospitals are, it's clear that they're under enormous pressure um, and we need to both prevent people going in and facilitate them getting out quicker. And, and it feels like we're working pretty collaboratively on that. I think there's some work to do on the discharge bit, um, but I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, your colleagues in the council are, are, are part of that conversation, and, and you know we're open to to collaborating with them to to to, to increase the um, there's this there's this gap between hospital and home, and and we've seen um, care homes closing and that capacity reducing, um, and I think you know that's very much in our sights. Is what can we do in that space that's going to get people out, give them a period of uh, care in a facility before they go home and and um i think we're talking about that on a regular basis these days i was thinking about the people who don't actually have to go into hospital yes. but obviously can't look after themselves yes yeah, so, i mean i know if, if jamela is still with us she she might have uh, a, additional information to add but we've explored yeah, all sorts uh, explored sorry i'm a voice in the sky options. Yeah, um, we've explored all sorts of options, particularly around enhanced payments for family members to support a, um, uh, somebody at home. Um, so we've, we've got a range of those models, but I, I think that as part of our conversation uh, with the public, there's also something about understanding acceptable levels of people remaining at home versus going into hospital. I, I, I think there's quite a traditional view that the safest place to be is in hospital and it's not it's not always the case. Um, so again, you know, this theme around how how we have a mature and honest conversation uh, with, with our with our citizens is it remains really important uh, with us and particularly as we we're 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 in really we don't like to talk about unprecedented challenging times because it we 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 get a bit more every week more than we thought we were expecting to have to cope with um but i would reference back before jamela comes in uh, one of the really good things we did uh, in covid which we're we're now expanding on where we worked with our voluntary sector colleagues on 
we called it the single point of access, the spa service. And they, that, that was for a group of people who wouldn't necessarily um, meet any uh, uh, level where they would interact with help. And, and let's face it, I mean, we love medicalizing people. That, that's our business, isn't it? And it, it's really not necessary. Many, many times we have to respect that people can be the custodians of, of their own help. But um, we, we got into a, a rhythm of, of, of engaging with people just to check in to see if they were, they were OK. Um, and the voluntary sector were brilliant at that. And, you know, those wraparound services that are about just keeping people safe. Um, and I know you talked about not necessarily <clears throat> people who hit hospital, but actually that, there's some of the discharge work that, that uh, Age UK do about getting people home, making sure that their, their house is warm, um, making sure that they've got milk, bread, butter, whatever the equivalent is. You know, that sort of um, how you support people to just be OK. Um, mm. Some really good examples of mm. that. So, so just building on what Steph was saying, so we've done, and like Steph said, we'd rather we'd rather support people on a prevention uh, agenda rather than you know bringing them into to social care. So we've got uh, we've done a lot of work with CVS uh, around um, community and voluntary support. So on our Live Well site, there's a whole rack of <coughs> services that our uh, primary care colleagues can can access, and also people can access. We've done some work around. Um, uh, and enhanced services with um, with Age UK, but equally we've also tested a a, a support service with uh, Mike and his colleague with Nimbus around the dementia hub, which I mentioned here before. So we've worked quite closely with primary care around supporting carers and people with dementia, so they don't need to come into social care services, but they can have that lower level care when they need it. And through the BCF, I think I brought the BCF to strategy very early on when I joined York to talk about all the schemes in there that really support people who are not quite eligible but social for social care funding, but actually need some sort of support at home because you're quite right, councillor. There are a, a lot of people who need support at home, but not actually care. And then our unpaid carers around the support that we wrap around those. Again, I brought the the, the carer strategy here uh, and the new um, carers contract here at Scrutiny a while ago to talk about how do we use uh, the, the contract in a much different way of supporting people who care for those at home in a different way. So there's a whole raft of um, schemes in place that support uh, communities and um, primary care do have access to those on the Live Well site. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Thank you, Chair. I was going to ask about receptionists because I've been on the end of a telephone line, but you, you've already answered that. So I'm quickly trying to think of what else I should ask. And one of the things that I've wondered about is um, the demand on the service. And I understand that um, during COVID, everything was pared down. But now, as you're getting back back on track the demand still seems to be really high is that because people's expectations are higher now or is it that um i'm i'm thinking if um it does does the demand it is it's not necessarily the first demand that they've made on the service so you could be um carrying out blood tests and things does that count as part of the demand yeah, um, I think there. Are, so, firstly, demand isn't going down, and I think it's uh, multifactorial. Um, one is that we've got the pressure behind the cork in the bottle, so we have got people who have delayed accessing services. Um, we talked about at length the, the long waiters for elective care. Um, we talked about the first port of call for, for a lot of people on waiting lists if they haven't been uh, contacted by their hospital consultant is to ring their GP. Um, 
And I think we also have to identify that we have flexed our workforce, but we are losing staff. We are genuinely losing staff. So the demand is real. The demand is absolutely real. Um, but actually, it's being managed by a smaller group of group of people as well. Even when we talk about uh, different professionals within the team who are greatly valued, um, many of them often need quite consistent uh, GP supervision. So that's another demand on 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 that care professional as as well. So um, I think that the demand the the demand is real. You know, when we 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 have very low numbers of people who, for whatever legitimate reason, don't turn up to their appointment. So in in York, um, it it runs between sort of five and seven percent. So that's about three thousand appointments where we've issued an appointment and uh, a patient isn't able to attend. Um, but yeah, the, the, we, we're not seeing any diminishing in the in the demand at all, and, and nor are our NHS one 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 colleagues, nor are our acute colleagues, or in 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 our urgent urgent care. I, I think it's too dismissive. People have used the phrase the Amazon culture, where uh, people imagine that they are demanding services. Uh, you know, next day or something like that. That's not the case. And certainly when we've done a lot of work around um, people who access services very frequently, actually very rarely is it inappropriate. Um, I, I, I bought into that narrative until we did the deep dive. You know, there's some gen genuinely ill people um, who, who need our support. Yeah. I'll build on that a little bit, but I, would, I mean, I think you, we could talk for a long time about this because the reality is it is multifactorial and we don't really know. Um, health anxiety, maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure, but um, the, the population is different. It's more distributed. They don't have the same support. People don't have the same support networks that they had before. Um, that's definitely a factor. The internet. People have just have so much access to information and, and actually it's quite difficult to make sense of it. You Google any symptom, it'll tell you, you, you can probably suggest you've got cancer or something really nasty. And the reality is you haven't, but you want reassurance that you haven't. So that definitely has a an impact. Maybe we do have greater expectations. You know, we live in a 24 hour culture. Maybe people want more immediate attention. I think there's a government focus on access. Um, all the evidence in general practice is not about access. It's about continuity that delivers better outcomes. But there's because we can measure stuff and governments like to performance manage, et cetera, et cetera, there's a real over focus on access targets. And I'm not sure that's always that helpful. We're in a situation where we've got waiting lists and backlogs, and that creates a demand in general practice. We're in a, the grips of an economic crisis. If anyone's familiar with the work of Professor Michael Marmot, you'll know that um, uh, the the um, economic hardship has a direct correlation with reduction in longevity and in, in, in lifespan. And we've seen that. So, you know, if you look at life expectancy from the Second World War up to 2008, it's linear going up all the time. Global financial crisis in 08, it flattens and it's still flat. But it's worse than that, because if you look into that, the, the, the high deciles of affluence is going up. And the lower their songs, it's actually going down. And you see that in our ICS. You know, part of the reason that my practice went down to, to work in Hull was because life expectancy down there was 10 years less on average than it is here. And if you look at life expectancy amongst your wards, you can see it. It's almost 10 years difference between Weldrake and Westfield, you know, like, or, or you know, so it's a real phenomenon. And, 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 and where we are right now, that's being magnified. A little bit. I'm not even halfway through my list now. New outbreaks of infections. So we've lived through a COVID pandemic. We've now got group A strep. What's going to be next? Something will be. Um, we can do more and more in general practice. We've been asked to do things that 10, 20 years ago would have been hospital only. Now we do it as a routine. Um, 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 we're aware of total demand. So maybe the perception of demand is greater. Um, people are more vocal. They're being asked to complain more. They're being asked to vocalize their discontent, which is great. But we hear it, don't we? Um, there's a workforce shortage. We've talked about that. And maybe some of the care is a little bit fragmented. You know, if you think about urgent care, we've got 111, we've got ED, we've got the out-of-hour service, we've got an urgent treatment centre, we've got general practice. 
you know? So what's happening is that people are rocking up multiple times with the same presentation in different parts of the system. There's definitely an element of that. You know, I rang a patient the other day who'd been on my list for an hour. I didn't think it was too bad. I rang her, she's in the ED waiting room. Because of that hour, she wasn't happy waiting the hour, so she'd rung 111 and they told her to go to ED. I spoke to her for two minutes on the phone and asked her she didn't really need to be there. And I sent her home from the ED waiting room from, the, from my GP surgery. That's a problem, and we need to work out a way to stop that happening. Anyway, I'll stop there. We could probably go on. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Heaton, please. Thank you. Um, what you say about the internet is very true. I had a family member of mine, um, a complex case, um, the consultant said to them after their first appointment, between now and the next appointment, don't go and speak to Dr. Google um, for, uh, for exactly those reasons. Um, I just wanted to look at elective recovery. Um, so I work with ICSs and trusts all around the country. And if you were that way inclined, you could put a bet on when you say, what are the challenges that you're facing? There was a elective care recovery. Um, so where do we sit, whether it's a trust or the wider system, where, where do we sit on a national basis there? Are we in a particularly difficult position? Are we in a difficult position, but further down the further down the line? Where are we? I've never looked beyond our eyes here. So I, I, I can't comment. We I get that we get so focused on what um oh sorry, what, what can we what can we do within our own system? I don't think I could adequately answer that, but I can go away and find out. Yeah, I'm not sure I can add anything to that. I mean, I think I think what we know is that our system is under immense pressure. You know, we've um, I think it's well publicised that the the trust are under intense scrutiny for those waiting times. And um, uh, you know, but I, I in my conversations I have, you know, obviously I see the national perspective from a primary care general practice perspective, but I don't hear differing narratives around the country. I think every, you know everyone's feeling the same. Certainly in general practice, the pressures elsewhere in the UK are comparable. Um, I think some of the things we put in place here are helping in a way that um, we're not seeing done elsewhere. But one of the, the points I make is that each each demographic is different and, and one size doesn't fit all. You know, that the point I'm making about local systems being empowered to do things that are right for their population and not expecting something that, um, works in Hampshire to work in Yorkshire, you know, for example, that's probably not a very good example, but you know what I mean? They're, they're just not transposable all the time. We've got to work it out for ourselves. One of the best innovations, we talked about the Children's Ambulatory Treatment Hub earlier. The reason that worked so well, um, it was set up to, to cope with a, 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 a potential surge in RSV, which is a, a virus that, that affects young children under two, gives them croup. And we set it up to, to, to combat that and it didn't materialize. And we were given like a free reign to evolve the system. So we changed it from under twos to under fives to under elevens. It went from croup to any respiratory presentation. We The referral pathways went from GPs to 111 to ED to YAS to the ambulance service. We just, we evolved it really quickly. And then it's turned into something that's really fit for purpose for our system. My anxieties, my slight anxieties, they're taking that and go, well, do it in Bradford and do it in Leeds and Hull and Newcastle. And it might not be right for them. You know, the concept of empowerment and evolution is right, but if you just lift it and shift it and dump it somewhere else, it might not work, you know? So, yeah. Thank you very much. I think we probably ought to be winding up before, before we do. I'm just going to check, is, is there anyone indicated to speak online at all? Yeah. Yes, okay. Hello, Sharon. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um... Hope you're feeling... Uh, up relatively okay considering yes 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 i am thank you um I've, I've just got a couple of points i'd i'd like to to make and uh, a, a, a request from scrutiny if i if i can be so bold um first of all just comments really um I, I, mike referred to the work of michael marmot who is very much um a, a guru on health inequalities and um, certainly his work and 
other data shows us that we have increasing levels of ill health um, uh, across the country, and York is 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 no different in that. So we're seeing um, in increasing numbers of people in the working age population uh, developing health issues, and so the demand that we have in the system isn't just um, demand caused through COVID. Um, it was demand that was already starting to increase before the pandemic. Um, obviously then coming out of the uh, pandemic, we've had all of the um, catch up issues that we've already talked about. Um, but we have a worsening health status in, in our population. Um, and 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 so you know that 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 is going to be uh, an ongoing uh, challenge uh, for us. Um, in in terms of the um, question um, uh, uh, earlier about um, uh, discharges from hospital and 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 work between the hospital and adult social care that that Shamela talked about. We mustn't forget that we have a, a combined acute and community trust. I think there's a tendency to forget um, that York um, Hospital is our community services provider as, as well. And uh, certainly um, my view that York community health services compared to other parts of the country I've worked in um, there is scope for improvement there and um, there's 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 certainly scope to look at a different um, uh, approach to the provision of community nursing services for example community uh, OT and other services as as well and um, I, I know Mike um, and I were both at the last meeting of the York Health and Care Partnership and um, Executive Board, the ICB York Place Board, and we we, we touched on that. Uh, and I'm sure that's a piece of work that um, the, the the board will be interested in 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 looking at that further. So, you know, it's not just um, uh, challenges around uh, adult social care packages. It's also a shortage in community nursing services um, that is leading to hospital admissions and certainly um, patients being in hospital longer than they should be because we haven't got the right level of community nursing support. So um, that, that, that's certainly uh, an area that um, I'm, I'm, I'm keen for us to look at uh, going forward as a system. The point I really wanted to make and, and why I put my hand up uh, initially is to go back to something that Simon Bell uh, said earlier. Um, he said we have always had, or certainly for many years had, the legislation that allows us to work in, in an integrated way. Um, and, you know, his, his challenge really is to, well, what stops us from working in that way? One of the things that stops us is the council's financial and procurement rules. So um, scrutiny members will recall that at the last scrutiny meeting, we had a discussion about the recommissioning of sexual health services and the challenges when our um, corporate um, finance and governance rules require us to go out to tender when we would much prefer to work with a system uh, putting in place um, a Section 75 partnership agreement, for example. And the challenge really um, there is in um, uh, helping or, or, or taking papers through to the executive when we're asking the executive to make decisions around the future procurement of, of services. And, and so I, I think perhaps there is a role for scrutiny and my ask of scrutiny is to perhaps um, uh, raise this issue with the executives so that the discussions that you have here in scrutiny 
um, uh, with our, our health partners. Um, the executive are aware of some of the discussions that, that we're having and um, uh, can take those into account when they're making decisions about recommissioning of services and um, the route we, we, we go down uh, to commission those services. And, you know, sexual health services is a very good example. We have a contract with Nimbus. Uh, we have a contract uh, with your hospital trust. We don't particularly want as a system to go out to tender. We believe that we can provide a better quality service, um, a, a more cost effective and efficient service uh, by not going out to competitive tender. But, um, you know, that that will actually uh, require um, a, an executive decision um, because it doesn't quite fit with our uh, finance and procurement rules as, as an organization. So, you know, those are some of the barriers um, uh, to Simon's point about, well, why, why can't we do more integration then? So uh, I think there would be, um, I would certainly value uh, scrutiny um, making the uh, ex ex executive uh, aware of some of those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you for that, Sharon, and, and, and uh, Louise. Hopefully, has been able to pick up a chunk of that. I've made a few notes myself in that respect. Um, an obvious question from me would be: obviously, um, the council has its budget limitations, and would have to work within those parameters. And you know. Um, if there's a competitive tender situation, um, I guess the the questions are: Would would the council, with its partners, be able to uh, of, offer something um, equally or better um, for um, the budget that's available? And I, I guess that's the question for the executive to make. Then um, the decision for them to to make. Um, I, I agree, um, Chair, except when we're talking about public health services, they're not funded by out of the council's budget. Um, they're actually funded out of the um, local authority public health grant allocation that comes directly from the Department of Health and Social Care. So um, obviously there is still a legal obligation uh, for the council to demonstrate that it's getting best value. Um, but going out to competitive tender isn't necessarily um, the best way. And there are other ways of being able to demonstrate best value. And I can see Tamela nodding because it's a similar issue for the NHS, isn't it, um, uh, Steph? You still have to demonstrate that those tests in in terms of quality uh best value etc are, are are met it's it's just a, a different method really for for doing that okay uh well perhaps uh, sharon and, and jabelli you, you can help us um draft something accordingly um mm. and that can be shared with members and uh, our, our partners here uh for us to to have a look at and um Hopefully we can then give our, you know, um, support to the aims that you're suggesting. Yeah, happy to, because there's lots of there's lots of ways we can do things differently, uh, especially with our health colleagues and the health and health and care act does give some flexibility because I, as you as you know, I always talk about redesign or redesign from within. So there are a number of options that we can put forward with scrutiny. I will link in with Sharon, because Sharon and I have had lots of conversations about um, how we can start commissioning things differently. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Fassi. Thank you, Chair. I would certainly support that. I was also just going to say, I'd, I'd propose a recommendation, uh, a different recommendation in the context of what we've discussed here this evening. So my recommendation would be uh, that City of York Council and the York Health and Wealth Be Wellbeing Board 
encourage all primary care providers across York to engage with the OPAL framework reporting system with the aim of better managing urgent and routine care in general practice. I'm happy to be advised if I've said that incorrectly or phrased it badly. But if, if you're happy with that, because we've, we've heard how the OPAL system is used by some, but not all uh, primary care providers. And we've heard that it would benefit uh, primary care if all the providers were there and the, the city council and the health and wellbeing board have a part to play in helping to encourage that. Sounds like a sensible recommendation. Members, could I, Mike, could I just make a suggestion? And, and I, I really do appreciate what you're trying to do there, uh, Councillor Vassi. I think, I think to engage in, in urgent care, definitely. I think the thing with Opal is, I'm not sure it's necessarily fit for purpose for general practice. And there's a piece of work going on now to, to um, update it and make it fit for purpose. Um, and so um, if you could reword it to, to reflect that, I think the other thing is, is to participate in the non-prejudicial sharing of data that enables systems to improve care for patients. You know, that's something that we're calling for the practices to do. We've got data share agreements between all the practices now. Um, it's that cultural shift. And I think if you if if you could call for that, like a cultural shift in how we handle data so that it's used for quality improvement and not in a prejudicial way, that would be fantastic. Yes, uh, and, and just to, one, one of my questions, which I didn't go into, didn't ask earlier, which, um, because I, th I thought it had been partly covered, but it follows follows on from that, and and it was referencing um, page fourteen of the agenda supplement uh, on NHSC data and um, how it extrapolates from GP booking systems. And my my question then was, if the data is unreliable, why is it unreliable, and what has been done about it? <laughs> well, it it's it's a complex answer i think systems often gp systems are all different so extracting data that's comparable and consistent across the country is a challenge um i, I think um the other thing is that the systems are evolving all the time so i've mentioned the e-consultation platform and we do you know all of our patients go on that now and we use that um, there's many patients who go on that system that don't find their way into system one which is our clinical database system um so in terms of the registering of an appointment, their records will be entered correctly, but it won't register that they've had an appointment. So I think there's a there's a there's a catch up phenomenon going on um, that 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 the extraction of data for general practice hasn't caught up with the technological advances that we're being mandated to do by the NHS. I might add. So, um, but what 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 we're doing about it is that I think even today we've had conversations. You know, Gary, Steph, myself, George, George. Um, Scott, who's managing data on behalf of the place board, um, and um, a lady called Alex Morton, who is the, I'll get this right, I think she's the director of primary and community care for the for Northeastern Yorkshire. We've had that conversation today about having a pilot in York so we can lead on this and get a, a consistent and, let's be honest, useful data set from general practice because it's, 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 it's absent nationally. Um, and, and I think we can potentially lead the way on that. Can I just check a, a, a form of words to see if we can get something that does what I think we both want to do? So if I've understood you correctly, uh, the City of York Council and the York Health and Wellbeing Board encourage all primary care providers across York to engage in the non, to take out the opal bit and to stay in the non-prejudicial sharing of data with the aim of better managing urgent care. Except, well, can I encourage you to, yeah. to, to say general practice instead of primary care? Oh, right. Okay. Primary, care, primary care refers to yeah. um, dentistry, community pharmacy, optometry, yeah. and general practice. But I think in this instance, what we really mean is general practice. Okay. With the aim of better managing. Uh, and and were, you, were you saying that it was urgent care rather than routine care? Oh, or that, care. right, managing care in general practice. Okay, so shall I read, shall I pass that on? 
Very wide. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I could be like, I mean, I think that's fine as a discussion. I mean, I think um, if we were being really uh, forward thinking, we might stop the division of care. You know, something to think about, maybe not now, but do we need to stop referring to primary care, secondary care, tertiary care, and social care and just refer to care? Because if we really are working in partnership across sectors, then it shouldn't matter. So the whole point of bringing health and social care together, really. Yeah. I've passed words on chair, and if you want to be sure that you're happy with that. Yes. So just to, to read this for, for members then, so that uh, the City of York Council and the Health and Wellbeing Board encourage all general practice providers across York to engage in the non-prejudicial sharing of data with the aim of better managing care and general practice. Everyone happy with that? Yeah, good. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I think I saw a lot of everyone nodding anyway, but <laughs> thank you. That's that's fine. Thank you very much to both of you for uh, coming along this evening and uh, and for a fairly lengthy meeting <laughs> this time of evening. Um, so very grateful to you. Um, I'm sure we'll be welcoming you to a future meeting at some point in the future. Also like to thank um, everyone that's joined us uh, remotely. Um, I think it's been a really interesting and useful uh, discussion we've had this evening. Um, I think I've gone through a whole range of emotions from, you know, some optimistic ones and some not so optimistic ones, perhaps, but um, hopefully there'll be some progress and, you know, together. Thank you very much. So members, we've just got the, the, the work plan. We've just got one more scheduled meeting. Um, unless any... One more scheduled meeting in February, unless um, we have anything urgent that crops up um, that we're not expecting. Um, is there anything members want to raise from that work plan that's there? In that case, uh, thank you very much. Um, good evening and take care on those icy roads going home. Yeah.